um, run through our college and we are planning more. So yes, it's, it's basically ongoing uh, support for our colleagues. That's really good. And the follow up question is, do you anticipate a surge in demand for prescription vapes under the new system? Uh, look, talking to, um, to, to, to members of the community already, I think that people, um, the, the people are able to access themselves um, nicotine replacement therapy over the counter in, in supermarkets and, and, and um, pharmacists. Um, but I think that certainly people have come to me for advice. Um, and um, I think there will, I think there will, you know, I think there will be people when the, it, it, if the enforcement is in place and it's not available outside your school or, um, you know, on the way, you know, on the way to university, when you're walking past it, it will, those kind of enforcement um, measures play a really important role. Um, because that availability is is one of the key uh, things that makes people access it, um, and obviously the Commonwealth has our role in stopping importation. Um, but um, but it is um, I think there will be some some there will be there will certainly some people will present to health professionals for assistance, uh, and we're there to help. And um, um, what what since you uh, I um, professionally feel. What's the what's the nicotine's effect in the short term on a person and the long term effect? Okay, uh, we used to say every cigarette is doing you damage, and actually every every suck on a vape does some damage. Um, and basically, it's the nicotine with the vape. You don't obviously get some of the other um, some of the other ingredients, but again, we don't know the ingredients base. But certainly, the effect on um, your blood pressure, pulse um, is immediate. Um, and again, the, the kind of midterm um, levels that we're seeing are um, again in escalating addiction to nicotine, um, uh, insomnia, um, because people it is uh, makes people more alert. Um, we um, we also again people seeing dental problems as well. Um, and you know, there's and there's re certainly the poisonings of children, young babies who access e-cigarettes is very real and, and seen in children's hospitals and the poisonings line. Um, I think that the uh, the long term effects we don't know. In uh, obviously in the states it's different carrier fluid. There have been what we call e valley young people ending up in intensive care um, from um, from um, for related to vaping. Um, so, and we have seen, there. Ha I believe there have been hospitalizations in Australia, rare, but again, it's the long-term effects that we just don't know about. And uh, with this prescription um, model uh, and the uh, Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, um, very important uh, organisation in all this, so what role do you think uh, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners uh, play in the long term? Yeah, and look, we've got an ongoing role in um, providing support and training for our colleagues. Um, we are the main, like I said, we make the main national guidelines on smoking and nicotine cessation. Um, so um, we do, um, and I think obviously training at all levels. Um, um, but uh, yeah, we 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 and again we are supporting the health of the community. We have a very strong role in prevention. Thanks. Uh, no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vo. Um, thank you, Professor, for appearing before the committee today. You will be provided with a copy of the transcript of today's uh, proceedings for corrections. The committee staff will also email any questions taken on notice from today and any supplementary questions from the committee. So once again, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank committee you. will now move to the next witness. Yeah.
good to go. I welcome our next uh, witnesses. Uh, Dr. Celine Kelso and Dr. Jody Moller, thank you for appearing before the committee today to give evidence. Uh, please note that the committee staff will be taking photos and videos during the hearing. The photos and videos may be used on the New South Wales Legislative Assembly social media pages. Please inform the committee staff if you object to having photos or videos taken. Um, can you please confirm? that you have both been issued with the committee's terms of reference and information about the standing orders that relate to the examination of witnesses. Yes, Doctor. I can confirm that. Same here. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have any questions about this information? No. Okay. As part of the formalities, uh, please first state your full name and position and then take the oath or make an affirmation. I'll start with this. Uh, yeah. Start um, with you, Dr. Moller. Yep, so I'm Dr. Jodie Moller. I am a chemical toxicologist from the School of Chemistry and Molecular Bioscience at the University of Wollongong. Um, and I, Jodie Moller, do hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Dr. Hi. Kelso. Uh, my name is Celine Kelso. I'm an analytical chemist within the same school at Jodie, so the School of Chemistry and Molecular Bioscience at the University of Wollongong. And I, Celine, do hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much. It's a good university. It's my university. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, would uh, either or both like to make a short opening statement uh, before we yeah. begin the questions? Um, yep, so I guess um, just to give you some context on um, who we are and what we've been doing. So we've been working um, in e-cigarette research since 2019 um, and basically we are both chemists. We specifically look at content. So any questions you've got to do with what is in an e-cigarette and what the chemical oh, content is and what the potential harms from that are um, is sort of the sort of questions that we're really well able to answer. Um, so across since 2019 what we've really seen is a shift from um, sort of free base nicotine over to nicotine salts, which has allowed the concentration of nicotine in um, in e-cigarettes to increase significantly. We've also seen that shift from bottles of e-liquid across to largely now, um, particularly amongst young people, the use of disposable devices. Um, so well, when you also when we're thinking about e-cigarette content, we really need to think about what the intended content is in an e-cigarette. Um, so someone mentioned before 200 compounds um, in an e-cigarette. There's actually very, very few compounds actually in an e-cigarette. Um, we do have some additional ones that get formed during the vaporization process, but generally 200 compounds is actually not very many for something that you're inhaling. Tobacco smoke, in contrast, has thousands of chemicals in it. Um, so it's actually a lot easier for us to identify what is actually in there because we can pull all of the pieces apart. Um, so we have the propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, which are the carrier fluids or the solvents um, that are what forms the cloud. We have nicotine and then we have a small collection of flavouring liquids in each of the e-cigarettes. Um, that's the intended content, but we then also have some of the unintended content, which is where the potential harm lies. So things um, like banned substances that shouldn't be in there at all, um, so contaminants and other things, um, heavy metals in some, um, in some cases from degradation of heating coils, um, and then we also have some of the ingredients reacting with each other to make new compounds, which have um, potential harm as well. Um, so I, do, I guess we sort of need to separate those two really importantly. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would really want to say um, as part of this um, brief intro is to highlight some of our recent findings um, for things that we've been doing recently. Um, so we've been focusing really on disposable e-cigarettes over the last year and a half. Um, and what we found is that nicotine is in all of them, regardless of what it says on the packaging, whether it says that it's nicotine free, whether it doesn't mention nicotine at all. Um, so about 98% of the samples we've analysed recently contained nicotine, regardless of what the packaging said. Um, young people are primarily using disposable e-cigarettes. They're not using refillable devices. Um, they're only using these disposable devices. Um, banned or dangerous compounds were found in about 4% of the products that we analysed. Once again, this is specifically in those disposable devices. Um, and just in response to the previous person, I'd just like to add as well, well that while we don't know long-term harms, that is absolutely true, we can be very confident 
because what we do know is what the content is of the e-cigarette compared to what the content is in cigarette smoke, we can be very confident that these are not as harmful as cigarette smoke. We know that things like formaldehyde and acetaldehyde, which are 100% present in e-cigarettes, are at least 20-fold lower in e-cigarettes than they are in cigarette smoke. They're both present. They are car carcinogenic, absolutely, but they're present at lower concentrations. Even the metals that we find off the coil, while they're present and they are absolutely dangerous, they're not present at the same concentrations they are in cigarette smoke. Um, so it has to be done, always be a comparison uh, between those, those different things. E-cigarettes are absolutely not good for you, but they're potentially better for you. They definitely are better for you than smoking. And anything you want uh, No, I think you covered pretty much everything, so I'll just happy to go to questions. Okay, thanks. Uh Doctors, uh, we'll move to questions, and I might just start off with a couple of questions. Um, in your opinion, and both or either can answer, what actions can the New South Wales government take to support the implementation of the Australian government reforms that are currently being debated in the federal parliament? At the, at the moment, we've seen that the supply or the access of those devices are mainly from illegal avenues. Um, I guess having a much more available supply via allowed pro routes like pharmacies, which at the moment is quite difficult to put your hands on, will allow to shift people towards the legal way, uh, which is simply just hard to get at the moment as well. So you're supporting the uh, banning of importation of these devices and so we definitely are supporting the banning of the disposable not only on uh, the environmental issues that are linked to that so batteries disposable resources pollutions yeah. but as well uh, in the fact that uh, if you want to curb the access to the young people which we know the young people are mainly using disposables preventing the access to those specific devices while allowing other users uh, ex-smokers ex for example, to access vaping products as they would need uh, would be the, the pathway we think it's the most appropriate. We understand the federal government is moving towards plain packaging, uh, moving towards uh, limiting the flavours to two flavours, um, restricting it to prescription only. Uh, what are your views on those changes by the proposed changes by the federal government? Um, so I guess with the flavours in particular, um, we do have con some, some concerns over the, the idea that they would be limiting these to only um, tobacco and mint flavourings. Yep. Um, the reasoning behind that is there is no chemical molecule that constitutes tobacco flavour. I can't, when I do a chemical analysis, you can't say to me, is, you know, does this only contain tobacco flavour? Because there is no actual chemical that is tobacco flavour. So when we analyse a tobacco flavoured e-cigarette, every single one of them is different and most of them contain exactly the same flavoring molecules as what we get in a an ice cream flavor or or in a strawberry flavor um, so they contain a lot of the sweet flavoring molecules things like um, um, ethyl maltol um, and they also sometimes also contain some of the cooling agents and things that we see in our other e-cigarettes so because it can't be defined how do you then enforce what is tobacco flavor and what is not um, so our concern there is you can call it tobacco flavour. Does that mean it actually tastes like tobacco? Um, I don't know how that would be, wh what level that would be enforced. Um, I think potentially putting limits on the maximum concentration of specific flavouring molecules, yes, absolutely that would work um, from an enforcement point of view. But I think just blanketly saying only tobacco and only mint, um, and obviously that's only going to be products that are coming through the legal pathway that are going to be limited to those. That's not going to be touching any of the products that are coming through the black market. So we're still going to be seeing um, the flavours available there. Additionally, we already have what's called a flavour concentrate. Um, so they're additional strong flavours that people can mix in themselves. So if you're filling up your e-cigarette, you can just add flavour in yourself anyway. Um, so potentially that also isn't going to impede people um, from going down that pathway but what you are doing is introducing potential risk as someone who's adding their own flavor could add too much have a really high concentration that potentially could be dangerous or cause them harm okay thank you um, just one more uh, you, you're the experts in the analysis of the chemicals that uh, go into um, vaping uh, cigarettes what's the most toxic chemical 
that you are aware of uh, that's going into the vapes? So in terms of uh, what we know about the chemicals that go in there, we know they're safe to eat. They exist in products that you consume in everyday life, like biscuit, yogurts, lollies, you name it. But we don't have much information as what happened to your respiratory tract when you inhale those compounds after they've been heated up. So we know that some of those flavors will decompose, create some other chemicals, which are formaldehyde, for example, and others, which are born from the degradation of those flavors. But in terms of the flavor itself, we don't know what happened to your lungs when you inhale them at high dosage as they could be present in the <coughs> e-cigarette uh, vapor. Okay, thank you. I was going to add, pro add, probably in terms of what we've actually seen recently, yeah. the, probably the most harmful thing we've seen was ethylene glycol, um, which is antifreeze. Um, that it was specifically in a set of disposable e-cigarettes that we analyzed recently that were confiscated off school-aged children from a New South Wales high school. Um, so the teachers confiscated them, they sent them to our other labs and we analysed those. Um, and that was the first identification of that compound in an e-cigarette industry. And the reason for that compound? The reason um, for that? We think it's a contaminant in the production of the propylene glycol, which is the, um, which is the, um, the main constituent of the solvent. Um, right. So our concern there is, once again, this is, this is what happens when we push products into a, bl a black illicit market, um, is that we start to see products in there um, that are not intended. Okay, thank you. Dr. McDermott. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for, for your submission and for being here today. This is day two of this hearings, of the public hearings, and your evidence and some of the things you've said and recommended are quite the opposite of what has been said on day one by pretty much all the parties, including parties in their submissions. So that you're nodding your head, so you're aware of that. So I'm going to challenge some of the things you've put because I'd like to hear your views. Um, but before I get to those questions, you made a comment statement that vapes are better than smoking and I find that hard to believe when we've heard like you just said there some of the chemical products that are actually been mixed into vaping uh, products um, the coils which we believe go back to will basically dissolve as you're, you're smoking them um, and the oils and others I, I find it quite incredulous that you could say that to me it's just one poison or another poison um, it's some of the properties which are seen to be in the vapes are a bit like mixing up meth and, and making that. I mean, I'm, I'm very surprised by that. So could you tell me, could you just justify how you could say that when there's not the long-term effects that we're aware of? We have no evidence to show what will happen in 30 years to the to people who take it. Short term, well, even that, I mean, I, I look at regulated tobacco and the purity of it, if I use that word, compared to say CHOP, which we see a lot of coming into New South Wales. Um, and then we see millions of vapes in the last few months prior to the regulations of the federal parliament coming in being imported into this country from China. I can't see how one could be better than the other. Can you make a comment on that? I'll start first. Um, I think when you want to compare the two, you have to compare, first of all, a same level of exposure. So if you are a one- Same level of what, sorry? Exposure. Okay. Yeah. So if you are a light smoker and a light vapor, the amount of chemicals that are entering your system in same quantity, so light versus light, would be much less than if you were vaping than if you are smoking. Now, if it's the same thing if you have a heavy smoker versus a heavy vapor. So you have to compare the how much you would do one versus how much you would do the other and comparing at equal, equal, sorry, equivalent levels, then you would have less exposure to toxic chemicals when you would be vaping against when you would be smoking. Now, if you are a light smoker, but suddenly vapes three bottles of vapes a day, then suddenly you will have more chemicals entering your system. And that's the evidence we've got, is that so far to this hearing, is that if you move from cigarettes to vapes, you vape a great deal more. And the fact that what you're taking in is a lot more nicotine, a lot more other chemicals than a simple cigarette. You may smoke 10 cigarettes a day, but once you start vaping, you're vaping a lot more than just equivalent to 10 cigarettes. So by what you've just said, you're taking a lot more chemicals already if you're doing that. It will depend on, on, the, on the vapor itself. Like if the person is a heavy vapor, for sure, I'm not contesting the fact that you will uptake more chemicals. But if your aim is to quit smoking by 
vaping about the same equivalent in controlled doses of nicotine, yeah. then you will vape same amount and therefore have in those cases a less chemical entering your yeah. system. So it's all a comparison of... Okay, the, yeah. so it's just one for yeah. one. Yes. And, and so what we're seeing, the evidence is that people aren't taking it one for one, they're taking it one for 20 or one yeah. for a lot more. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add, so I guess it, we know in toxicology, the dose makes the poison. Yeah. yeah? So I, um, what, and what, we, what we know for a fact is that the carcinogenic compounds that are present in tobacco smoke, that is the things that cause the cancer and the other things that we know smoking causes, mm. are present in vapes at lower concentrations by many fold lower. Not right. not if you take if you vape twenty times more than you would smoke. We're talking like hundreds of fold difference between the, the levels of these contaminants. So yes, absolutely, I'm not saying vaping is good for you by any stretch yeah, of the I, imagination. I, even that comment, but I'm it is a scale. You, but you, you, know, you, you say that, but you know, that hasn't got metal. Uh, coils in, in the No, in but, the there is, but there's metals in tobacco. Right, okay. So so arsenic is in tobacco. There's yeah. all these metals that are present in the coils. And, and let's be honest, the dangerous metals yep. that we're seeing are largely present in the disposable style e-cigarettes, yep. which we have recommended should not be allowed. Okay. So disposables are where we're seeing the dangerous compounds like the ethylene glycol and like the high levels of metals. So when you say stop importation, you're talking about just disposables, are you? Well, that's we would is like produced here, so it's all imported. Well, right. we, we, the only thing we would like to see de can de definitely banned in Australia is the use of disposable e-cigarettes. Right. Okay, all right, good. Well, thank you for those answers. <laughs> I'll, I'll just be quick because I know I've got to go on. But um, like you were saying in the very beginning. Um, you're making recommendations which are different to everybody else's and one of them was that do you believe re uh, regulation of e-cigarettes in line with other tobacco products could be put in place rather than a total ban um, why um, our concern around that is that we so what we saw in response to the 2021 changes to the e-cigarette regulation so in october 2021 um, we saw the, the last major regulatory change um, and what we saw was the market shift within two months um, to remove the word nicotine from their packaging to a label, allow them to go through a loophole yeah. to sell them over the counter. Um, our concern is that the market is going to shift quickly again mm. um, to find a way to continue selling. And, uh, and we mentioned in our, um, in our submission that we've already seen um, our watches that are, that are a vape. We've seen drink bottles that are a vape. We've seen iPhone covers that are a vape. I've even seen a Ventolin puffer, looks exactly like yeah. a Ventolin puffer. Yeah. That one was a cannabis vape, not a nicotine vape, <laughs> but um, that is, it's completely indistinguishable. Um, and I believe that the market will shift again um, and what we'll see is stealth products coming in and they will still be coming into Australia. Young people will still be utilising them. Um, where and effectively that pushes it deeper into a black market and I'm concerned that that means there are more contaminants um, and more dangerous compounds getting into these products. We've already seen the introduction um, of some of these banned substances in the last 18 months. Um, we don't want to see dangerous products in e-cigarettes in Australia at all, whether they're on the black market or elsewhere. Um, so if we have a regulated system, um, we can have much greater control over what is actually so in you're regulating the, e the, the actual um, e-cigarette as well and the quality of the Correct. Like well, we can get quality control on what is available. In an attempt in to undermine the, the black market and organised crime. Exactly that. Okay, right. Thank you. Um, just one last question. Um, you mentioned the cooling agents, uh, WS23. What is that exactly? Can you explain what it is and what its effect is? So a coolant agent, uh, as we categorise in there, is a compound that when you inhale, gives your mouth a cold feeling without the taste of mint. So the, the morning brush for your teeth and then you inhale and then that cool feeling that you get in your mouth, it's created by some of those compounds. So they are odourless, tasteless, but have that potential of giving that cooling feeling when you inhale. So those are classified as coolant compounds and there we have found two types of those compounds present in e-cigarettes. So those have been used to date in mint toothpaste lollies. They are safe to eat. So they go through your um, stomach and get digested right. before they enter your body. But we have no evidence as to they, how toxic they are when they get through your lungs. So you're concerned about what will happen. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for those, answering those questions. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh, member for Cabramatta. Yeah. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Jody Mola and uh, Dr. Celine Kessel for coming to the hearing today. Uh, <coughs> the the, the um, 
the beauty of this um, hearing is uh, we have different views, and uh, and that's the best because uh, by hearing all your evidence and expertise, hopefully this parliament will um, come to uh, make better legislation uh, on this because it's quite important. And, and I hear that you've said like e-cigarettes e are not as harmful as uh, uh, tobacco because because um, we know what is in them or at least most of the substance maximum is 200 compounds and uh, flavors do not contain extra compounds or poison or harmful substance like the flavors they don't really uh, uh, and uh, do you think we should have more than just two two flavors um, I guess, like I said earlier, I think the issue really around the, the two flavours is it's not two flavour molecules. A mint e-cigarette now doesn't just have menthol in it. It has menthol and sweeteners um, and cooling agents and yeah, other things. It's probably um, like so even though it's got mint on the label, um, it isn't just a single flavouring molecule. And like a tobacco has even greater variation. There's no... Um, there's no specific um, set of molecules that are in a tobacco flavoured product. And my concern is over limiting to tobacco, what you'll end up with is potentially, I don't know, like a, um, a sweet tobacco, a, a cool tobacco, a, a wild tobacco, who knows what it comes up, ends up becoming. Um, and each of those are actually, you know, strawberry with tobacco or, or something else with tobacco. Um, it's, as long as it's got tobacco on the label, does that get through the regulation? So I think it's, it's really about focusing down on um, specific chemical components um, instead of broad names of things. Um, and at the, let's be honest, at the moment, uh, through the, particularly through um, the, the illicit market, we see products that don't even have a flavour associated with them. Like we've, there was one called Assault and one called Blitz and one called... So we'd rather see a limitation on making sure that at least the flavour is associated, the flavour name is associated with an actual flavour um, than pursuing the tobacco and mint restrictions. Mm. And we do know that a lot of ex-smokers do use flavours. The vast majority of them do not vape tobacco and mint flavour. They do actually, their fruit is also the, the, the number one um, flavour option for ex-smokers in addition to young people. Yeah, like, so, <coughs> so, so you're more, you support more, uh, regulations because you think uh, e-cigarettes are not as harmful as tobacco but you support more regulations so what important actions for the New South Wales government um, to take to support the implementation of the Australian government's reforms what, what, what are your recommendations or what suggestions do you have? I think enforcement would be the biggest one I think at the moment the biggest problem is that we've got a regulation there um, that says that e-cigarettes that contain nicotine cannot be sold over the counter um, but in reality, that is not happening. We're seeing um, thousands and thousands of e-cigarettes being sold over the counter through tobacconists um, and other places every single day. And that largely comes down to, and um, we, we've done work with the, with the enforcement teams through New South Wales Health, um, there's just not enough people to do all the enforcement that's required um, because so many places are selling these products. Um, and then obviously also uh, making sure that there is deterrence for the people that are caught doing the wrong thing. Um, we need to make sure that if someone is selling a product Ill illegally over the counter, um, that there is actually a penalty, a significant penalty for that, to deter them from continuing to sell that product. Um, in our local area, where we are, um, just in the suburb, like just where, where I live, there has been um, two American candy stores open in the past six months, uh, three months. Um, both of them sell tobacco products, including vape products over the counter. Um, and we're also recently seeing an increase in nicotine pouches um, as well. Um, and that's obviously an additional concern because young people can use those incredibly stealthily um, in the classroom if necessary. Is Amer I'm sorry, Trip. The American Candy Store, does it sell candy as well yes, and yes, like yep. things for children? Yes. Candy and yes. So it has children's products yep. like tort lollies mm -hmm. and it does vapes as well? Correct. Um, and they're directly, so this, that particular one that's opened at Bulla is directly across the road from a primary school. Mm. And there's, no, there's been no enforcement to look at that. Thank you. Sorry, Maybe. Sorry. No, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm done, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Bo. Uh, Phil, we've got the member for Orange on WebEx. Um, good morning, doctors, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Just a couple of questions. Um, just in relation to that last point you were talking about, um, uh, Dr. Moller, in relation to, I suppose, 
um, enforcement or, or lack of um, proper enforcement. Um, there's, you know, health inspectors and or police uh, are the essentially the enforcement agencies that generally, I suppose, investigate a lot of these types of issues or inspect these premises. Um, but you, you clearly say that there's not enough um, resources from either of those agencies to target appropriately target the number of premises that are popping up all over the place to address this. Is that right? Is that your? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I that? think that I think that's definitely true. I think the other difficult part has been that with the current regulation, and this is changing potentially when the new laws get through federal parliament. Um, but mm. with the current regulation that's been in place, um, you mm. a nicotine free e-cigarette was legally allowed to be sold over the counter to anyone over 18 but a nicotine containing e-cigarette required a prescription and that meant that stores were just removing the word nicotine and selling them over the counter um so yeah. in order to prove that it contained nicotine it had to actually go to a chemical lab yeah. and get analyzed um and that obviously is a lengthy process it takes time you can't just walk in there see an e-cigarette and realize that that needs to um that needs um to be seized so uh, potentially with an improvement in the federal regulation around these, um, that will allow that process to become easier uh, because all e-cigarettes will then fall under the same um, umbrella uh, and hopefully yeah. that will assist with enforcement. Yep, okay. And just, and just finally, um, essentially a lot of the issues you said in relation to items that you're searching or, or examining, um, seize items or seize vapes or e-cigarettes, uh, majority of the overwhelming majority of disposable types, is that right? Yeah, over ninety, over ninety percent. Yep, and and I'm not a smoker nor a vapor, but as of my understanding, in cigarettes there there are filters. Conventional cigarettes have filters in them. You aware of that? Yep. Yep. Oh, in your head. Yep, that's an agreement. Is do you know whether these vapes do they have filters in them at all? No. No, but no. they're but no, but you don't. They don't produce particulate. So. And, and the aerosol that is produced from an e-cigarette um, is actually yeah. a suspension of tiny droplets of propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. Um, so there's not particulate matter. It's not smoke. So when you produce, when you burn an e a, a normal cigarette, what you're producing yeah. is actually solid particles um, that are in the form of smoke. So what that's filtering out is some of the tar and some of those solid particles. Um, an e-cigarette doesn't have it's an aerosol it's not a, it's not smoke so it doesn't require a filter right but there, there's no filter in the overwhelming majority of of these disposable vapes that you're saying but um to to filter any of the i guess contents of that vape into your lungs is it no but that. it's uh, because it's not particulate it wouldn't be captured on a filter anyway it would pass okay. through the filter yeah okay yeah, no further questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank, thank you. you uh, thank you, Mr. Donato. Well, um, that concludes the questions, and thank you, uh, doctors, for both uh, appearing before the committee today. You will be provided with a copy of the transcript of today's proceedings for corrections. The committee staff will also email any questions taken on notice from today and any supplementary questions from the committee. So thank you both uh, for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, the committee will have a 15-minute uh, break, 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 and then uh, we'll we'll Maybe come back. <laughs> we'll come back at 10:45 uh, p.m. <laughs>
Okay, we might make a start. <coughs> I uh, welcome our next witness, Dr. Colin Mendelson. Um, thank you for appearing before the committee today to give evidence. Uh, please note that the committee staff will be taking photos and videos during the hearing. The photos and videos uh, may be used on the New South Wales Legislative Assembly social media pages. Uh, please inform the committee staff if you object to having photos or videos taken. Um, can you please confirm that you have been issued with the committee's terms of reference and information about the standing orders that relate to the examination of witnesses? I have. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions about this information? No. Um, thank you, Doctor. Um, as part of the formalities, please first state your full name and position and then take the oath or make an affirmation. So I'm Dr. Colin Mendelson. Um, I have no current position. I'm uh, a former founding chairman of the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association, a former conjoint associate professor at the University of New South Wales, former member of the committee that develops the Royal Australian and GP uh, smoking cessation guidelines, uh, amongst other things. Um, and just the affirmation? Yeah. yeah. So I hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Doctor. Would you like to make an opening yes, statement thanks. before we go to questions? So yes. Australia's policy on vaping is driven by valid concerns about harm to young people. But we need to balance the small harms to young people against the substantial benefits of vaping in reducing death and disease from smoking. Modelling studies consistently show that vaping has a positive effect on public health overall, and regulation should reflect that. What we currently have with vaping in Australia is prohibition, and drug prohibitions are rarely successful. Vaping is so harshly restricted in Australia that over 90% of users don't comply with the current regulations. This is predictably created a thriving and dangerous black market controlled by criminal gangs with serious escalating violence. The vast majority of products are unregulated, have no quality control, and we've made it easier, not harder, for young people to access these products. And perhaps most importantly, we've reduced legal access by smokers who need these products to quit. History's shown that enforcement and border control efforts have minimal harm on the long-term supply of drugs. I don't think there's any question about that. We know the war on drugs has failed. And the only significant way to reduce a black market is to replace it with a legal and regulated one. The New South Wales Parliament must decide whether to continue the failed regulatory model to continue criminal supply of these products or to take control and regulate the market. And that, I think, is the key message to this committee. The best way forward is to make, make vapes available as licensed retail, as adult consumer products from licensed retail outlets with strict age verification like cigarettes and alcohol. This will bring Australia into line with other Western countries. It will reduce youth access it will enable legal access for the smokers who need it, and it will reduce the black market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move uh, to questions from the committee, but uh, uh, Dr Mendelssohn, I need to um, bring to your attention um, that you've been named by a previous uh, a person given witness. Yeah. Uh, in, and. Uh, They've indicated, the witness said, mm. uh, Dr. Colin Mendelssohn, in his submission, the former chairperson of ATHRA, has suggested that we set aside areas where young people can vape at school. If that's not a tantamount, we have a problem. I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. How would you like to respond to that comment? I think we all have to accept that what we're doing at the moment isn't working. I mean, we're constantly told that we have a huge behavioural problem at schools where kids are... Uh, suffering from nicotine withdrawal and unable to concentrate. What we're doing isn't working. What I'm suggesting is a pragmatic, compassionate approach that recognises that we have a problem. 
And I'm suggesting a practical solution to that problem. And that is that for young people who are nicotine dependent, who have the per permission of their parents, and who have nicotine withdrawals, that they be allowed to vape in a, uh, an agreed area in, in schools so that they can get through the day and they don't disrupt the class and as a compassionate solution for them. Uh, I think we'd rather not be in this situation, but we are, and this is about harm reduction. This is about accepting the situation as it is and finding a practical solution. I would rather kids didn't smoke or vape, but I'm being pragmatic. Shouldn't those kids be seeking medical advice rather than just freely be allowed to but, but this is not about freely allowing this is about accepting that some kids are addicted and will continue to vape no matter what we do and we want to minimize the harm to them and the harm to classes their classroom um, we would rather kids didn't vape in a perfect world we would rather they didn't vape but I have to say vaping is one of the least harmful risk behaviors that kids indulge in I'd much rather my children or grandchildren vaped than smoked binge drunk drink drove, uh, used illicit drugs, were engaged in sexual violence, suicide behaviour. Kids are exposed to much greater risks than vaping. I think we've got this out of perspective, to be honest. Dr. Many of the submissions the inquiry has received argue that e-cigarettes is a pathway to mm. normal cigarettes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and vaping um, is really just another pathway to get people yeah. um, addicted to nicotine mm -hmm. and then um, after a while they'll yeah. just move on to normal cigarettes. What's your view on that? Uh, look, I think, I think that's been debunked. We heard this same um, uh, scare story with marijuana, that kids would progress to, to dangerous drugs. Of course, it didn't happen. And we're not seeing that with vaping. So what's happening with vaping is that Vaping overall is diverting young people away from smoking. It's actually a gateway out of smoking. As vaping rates go up in populations, and we see this in, in most countries, that smoking rates accelerate downwards. So vapes and cigarettes are substitutes. Why would you, if you're a kid who's vaping, a mango flavored vape, which is you know a tenth the price of smoking, why would you progress to stinky cigarettes that are much more expensive, that make you cough and are much less enjoyable? And we're not seeing that progression. Um, it, it's, it's, so the, 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 what, we, what we understand is, yes, kids who vape are more likely later to be smokers, but there's no evidence that vaping causes them to take up smoking if they otherwise wouldn't have. So we explain that a much pl more plausible explanation is that Kids who try vaping are just more likely to be risk takers. And they're more likely, we know they're more likely to smoke, to drink, to use drugs. That doesn't mean vaping causes you to drink, ta drink or to take drugs, nor does it cause you to vape. It's just that these kids have common risk factors, genetic, social, environmental, mm. that make them more likely to smoke anyway. So there's no evidence of causation. And in the real world, we're seeing that as vaping rates go up, smoking rates are falling. I think that's the bottom line. So I think the evidence is very clear now that yes, some kids may have progressed to smoking who might not have, but far more kids are progressing away from smoking and being diverted from smoking. And there are smokers who are switching to vaping as well, who are switching away from smoking. And that's a good thing. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Dr. McDermott, do you have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, I do. Um, as has already been said by the Chair, your evidence is at odds with everybody else's. To be in honest, Australia, that's true. Ways. That's true in Australia. Okay. Um, not just in Australia, let's be honest. It's also, but also that other places as well. And we haven't just been looking at Australia in this, this inquiry. So let's just look at that. We've been told there is a health crisis. Mm -hmm that it's the same type of health crisis that we had some decades ago, the people smoking cigarettes, which we've then fought and through government policy and other ways we've, we've changed and lowered the amount of impact of intake of tobacco uh, products. Mm -hmm. But now we are facing a new generation. You, you made a comment that the impact of vapes, um, e-cigarettes, is only small harm mm. to young people. Mm. And you said that in your submission mm. as well. Um, 
that is once again opposite everyone mm. else is saying. Of course. Now, yeah. if we look at this, um, you've said that you know, nicotine is especially beneficial for young people with ADHD, proving attention and brain function. Mm -hmm. We've been given evidence the opposite of that, especially from mm -hmm. a number of young people who have mm -hmm. spoken to us, mm -hmm. one in particular, um, who said that uh, she didn't do it because she was a risk taker. She was quite the opposite. It was the social environment. Mm -hmm. You've also put to us this morning um, that we should have a special area for kids who are mm -hmm. caught on vaping, um, which could be argued, I would say, would just increase the amount of people vaping because now those children now have their own little area to go off and go in, even mm -hmm. if they are addicted. So I'm just challenging your things, and I'd mm -hmm. like to hear your comments back because um, it greatly concerns me that someone with your expertise could mm -hmm. say these things mm -hmm. when other people mm -hmm. have been saying the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if, if you could, please. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Look, I think it's important to say that I'm strongly evidence-based. I make a study of the literature and I'm very aware of what's in the peer-reviewed scientific literature and overseas experience. That's my agenda. My agenda is to save lives and improve public health. To answer some of the questions, is vaping a health crisis? Absolutely not. It's perceived and promoted as a health crisis What's a health crisis is that 20,000 Australians are dying every year from smoking. That's a health crisis. The, no one has ever died from vaping nicotine. We've heard about Ivali this morning. But That's, isn't that just because we don't have the long-term effects we've yet? Had 20 years, we've had 20 years. If there was going to be some concern, over 20, after 20 years we'd have some clear evidence. In terms of long-term harm, I have to say, I think that's a bit of a furphy. We never insist on long-term proof of harm in any new treatment that we introduce. We introduced COVID vaccines after three months. We weren't concerned about, oh, but what about in 30 years' time we might find there's some problem? We thought, no, the risk of, of delaying this is much greater than the potential risk of introducing yeah. it. And that's how we make medical decisions. Yeah. And to say that we don't have long-term harm, therefore we shouldn't use it, ignores the fact that 20,000 people are dying every year in Australia, 8 billion, 8 million globally every year. And we've got to consider that in our long-term assessment. Um, just on the point that you made earlier about are e-cigarettes actually safer than smoking, there is no question that e-cigarettes are dramatically safer than smoking. From the scientific research, we know that there's over 7,000 chemicals in smoke, mostly in high doses. There's generally less than 200 chemicals in vapour. It's most, they're mostly less than 5%. Almost all are less than 1% of what they are in smoke. We know that the poisons in vapours after they've switched from smoking drop dramatically. We know that people, when they switch from smoking, their asthma improves, their COPD improves, their blood pressure improves, uh, they, their lung function improves, they have fewer respiratory functions. There are a whole range of health benefits. But, but isn't that, with, and I'm trying to interrupt you, but no. I'm just trying to explore yes. this. Okay, I'm not having a go at you no, no, no. exploring this. But if I put to you this, is that you're talking about uh, people taking e-cigarettes that are perhaps regulated, perhaps we know what the product is. The millions of vapes that are coming in from China at the moment, um, record highs up yeah. until this yeah. month. Um, you know, we got a what's in them. We talk all kinds of chemicals. It's like trying to say, well, mm. and I'll go okay, to other, other drugs, you know, there's certain levels of of you know, chemicals, et cetera, methamphetamine, mm -hmm. compared to, to a, a well-mixed bout of cocaine. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm looking yes, at the product I, I know what itself. You mean. And I think Dr. J. Moller answered mm. that question. There's yeah. very small differences. Mm. She pointed out, yes, there are cooling agents. Three or four percent had banned substances, uh, chemicals in them. Um, there, were, there, there were higher levels of metals. But there's not a lot of difference. The fact is that they're vastly safer than cigarette smoking. Um, so, and of course, what I'm here to say is that we need to stop this black market. Um, we're not going to stop it by enforcement and, and, and policing. We're only going to stop it by changing to a legal regulated model. I'm very against the black market. It's, it's, it's doing a lot of harm, but um, we can't just stop it by the methods that are being suggested. Can I just explore mm. the black market just mm. briefly? I know you're mm. not from law enforcement. No, but I'll just ask. Mm. So who runs the black market into this country? It's yep. mostly from China, is that correct? No, it's mostly controlled by criminal networks. Yep. Uh, mostly Eastern, Eastern, Middle Eastern gangs um, supported by outlaw motorcycle groups. They employ young people uh, as dealers. 
they have young people who perform some of their crimes, carjacking and the actual fire bombings for them. So yeah, it's mostly organised crime. Organised crime. Talking about e-cigarettes. No, that's that's run by organised crime. And the health minister said that the profits from organised crime uh, are being used for um, sex trafficking, drug yeah. trafficking, yeah. and other illegal offences. Yeah, I understand that. But what I'm asking yeah. you mm -hmm. is that we know that the e-cigarettes, predominantly, that are coming into this country are imported, mm -hmm. disposable, yeah. etc. Particularly, are yeah. coming from China. Yes, millions that's right. of the yes, that's right. a month. Okay. Yeah. So. But that isn't coming into organised crime, is it? It's yes, coming it is. in into it's being being sector. imported by organised crime groups, groups yes. as well as shops. Well, and, mostly and other the shops. Organizations. Mostly the shops buy them through organised crime groups. Some do import directly, but the vast majority are, are, are imported by organised crime groups who have a network of distributors who visit shops and and. Uh, try and arrange for them to sell their products. And you have evidence of, of that? Oh, that's well known. That's well known. Well, no, I, I've worked organised crime for many years, mm -hmm. so it's not so well known. Yeah. And, I'm, and we're putting things in evidence here yes. in this hearing. So I put this question to you again. Do you have evidence, have you seen evidence of this network you're talking about for e-cigarettes? I, I understand, well, I understand, and I've spoken to a criminologist from Melbourne, uh, Dr James Martin, who assures me that the organised crime groups who import tobacco products yep. have now pivoted to e-cigarettes okay. and so they are being they are using uh, importing these products through their networks and okay. and and I've read that from other sources as well okay well, thank you thank you doctor but to answer some of the other questions yeah please uh, are, are vapes uh, a small harm for young people yes they are the main concern is nicotine dependence and about from our two largest national surveys recently, the ASAD and the National Strat Drug Strategy Household Survey, about 3 to 5 per cent of 14 to 17 year olds have said they may be addicted to these products. That's the, in their words from the drug strategy. So that's the main concern. Nicotine dependence is a concern, but it's not a serious medical issue. Vapes are not as addictive as smokes. Uh, if kids stop vaping, they'll get over that in a couple of weeks. It'll do them no harm. Other serious effects, um, there's very little evidence of that. There's no evidence that vaping causes um, serious, uh, functionally important respiratory problems. There's no evidence it triggers asthma. It doesn't cause seizures, normal vaping, uh, in spite of what we keep hearing. Um, it doesn't cause spontaneous pneumothorax. It doesn't cause serious lung disease. There are no serious harms that I'm aware of in the medical literature in young people. Yes, they may get short-term cough, wheeze, and that's not good. It's transient. So I think there's a lot of moral panic about the harm to young people, but the facts uh, from the scientific literature do not support that being a, a serious concern. And I have to say that of all the people who vape in Australia, Teenagers are less than 5% of the total. And I think it's, we need to look at the balance of that in determining our policy to vaping. Are we going to make a policy that's causing a small amount of harm to a small number of people? And to what extent do we need to consider the needs of the 95% of people who vape who are at immediate and substantial risk from smoking, which otherwise many of them would be doing? Thank you, Doctor. We'll now move to the um, member from uh, member for Orange, uh, Doctor <laughs> Mr. Phil Donato. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, I just want to ask you some questions in relation to some of the evidence that you've given thus far. Mm -hmm. uh, you said in your in your opening address that uh, vaping was so harshly regulated mm -hmm. in this state. Um, but we've heard evidence that, in fact, you can buy vapes in basically any sort of convenience store. Um, you can buy it from mm. tobacco shops, the stations, lolly shops, mm. online. Mm. You can buy it through social media platforms. It's hardly a regulated industry. You have to. Oh, agree. It, uh, uh, that's exactly not not the opposite to that. So. What you're talking about is black market illegal products are available everywhere, and that's the problem, and that's what I'm arguing we need to do something about. The legal right. regulated market is less than 10% of the total, and it's because we're so strictly regulating it that 
people aren't using the legal market. We heard from Professor Ivers this morning that our GPs would just step up and supply these products. It's not going to happen. I've taught thousands of GPs about smoking and I can tell you that and there have been a couple of studies recently that have questioned GPs. There have been peer-reviewed studies questioning Australian GPs about vaping. They found that the GPs are not informed about vaping. They say that we don't know about it. We don't know how to write scripts. We're sceptical about it. We, we're not even sure why are they asking us to do this. We have medical legal concerns. You know, we are asking us to prescribe a drug that's not approved. GPs are very reluctant to take, up, take this issue up, and I've spoken to a lot of GPs about that. Pharmacists are very unwilling to, to dispense um, vapes, and very few have a significant stock. And patients say, why should I go to the doctor and the pharmacist, spend my time, all that inconvenience, and have to go to the pharmacy to buy products that I don't like, that have a restricted in flavour and nicotine? I can tell you that the, ph that the, the, ph the, pharmacy, the pharmacy model is not going to work. Right. Um, Dr. Uh, um, you've also, the terms of reference for this committee are broadly around, I suppose, um, you know, the effects that this has on young people, its availability mm -hmm. and prevalence amongst young people, mm -hmm. who, who most, pe most of those young people aren't going to the doctors and getting prescriptions for e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. They're purchasing from, um, like I said, from disposable, uh, either on, on, on um, social media, We've heard evidence that you can purchase it on uh, TikTok and Snapchat and those platforms uh, or, or other stores. Um, and we've also heard evidence um, that, and I want to challenge you or, 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 or ask you some questions in relation to what you said about the, you know, the, 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 the harmful impacts or, you know, there's been no, no serious uh, health consequences, I'm paraphrasing you here, um, result of people vaping. But, you would agree with me, there's been young people being hospitalised. We've heard that in this inquiry that people have been mm -hmm. taken to hospital. You would agree with that? What does that mean, though? That means they've gone hospital to the emergency room. People taken to hospital, young people taken to hospital. Well, I'd like to see the evidence for that. I think a lot okay. of what happens is that kids to use these high nicotine products that are available through the black market. They get nauseous, mm. they get dizzy from too much nicotine. They're not, not smokers. They pass out, they're taken to the hospital. I've not seen right. any evidence of any serious harm. Okay, so so we've heard that these are um, a lot of these illegal vapes are, are highly um, comprised of um, extremely high levels of nicotine. Mm -hmm. That's you would agree with that? Yes. Yes, and nicotine is a highly addictive drug. You'd agree with that? Uh, depending on the way it's given. Depends on the way it's okay. given. Okay. So if if you give it a patch, it's not. Okay, and this inquiry is also heard. Um, well, high levels of nicotine we're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, what's been consistent across this inquiry is that these vapes comprise high levels of nicotine, mm -hmm. uh, not much higher than what you would ordinarily get in, in cigarettes that you would purchase, commercial cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Look, I think the black yes. market products are very high in nicotine, and that's one of the problems with this black market. They, they provide unnecessarily high concentrations of nicotine and that's why we need to eliminate the black market. Yeah, and they can, that, that, that can cause, and we've heard evidence that um, anxiety, depression, uh, impacts to respiratory, lungs, teeth, gums, all those types of things are some of the uh, side effects um, from these vapes. I think there's very good evidence now that it's vaping... Really I think there's very good evidence that nicotine relieves anxiety, it relieves depression, it improves cognition, memory, alertness, uh, it's pleasurable, and it helps a whole range of medical conditions. If people are addicted right. to nicotine and they stop it, they will get withdrawal, and that lasts 10 to 14 days. And yes, during those times, people will have some anxiety uh, as a result. Right. So, so what you just said there was that um, um, in, a, in essence, is that uh, you're disputing then, are you, that um, these harmful impacts that others have told this inquiry, these e-cigarettes e or vapes cause, especially the, the, the illegal ones that you purchase in these premises or locations, um, you're saying they actually can be quite beneficial. Is that, is that your evidence? What I'm saying is that there are positive benefits from nicotine. 
And, and that's one of the reasons people smoke. They, they smoke to relax, they smoke to help them concentrate, they smoke because they enjoy it. I'm saying that some of the kids who use these products will experience some of those positive benefits. I'm also saying that I don't think kids should smoke or vape, but that's why they're choosing to use these products. But surely the harmful impacts that these vapes are having would outweigh those positive impacts that you say. Wouldn't you agree? I, I would strongly disagree with that. I, I would strongly Sorry? disagree with that. I would strongly disagree with that. So I wrote an article recently that argues that the overall impact to young people from, for their public health is beneficial from vaping. Now, I'm not encouraging kids to smoke or vape, but when you look at the evidence, the fact that smoking rates amongst kids are falling faster than ever as vaping rates go up, to me that far outweighs any harm, and I think the harms are fairly small. I think most vaping by young people is experimental and short-term. It's a pattern which isn't associated with any serious harms. Um, and, and the benefit of not smoking, smoking is deadly. Smoking kills two out of three long-term people. We only have to stop a small number of people smoking to see a substantial benefit. Um, as I said, there, you know, I've yet to see any serious harms in young people from vaping. But you'll agree with me, we haven't had a lot of time in relation to vaping. It's only been a fairly uh, recent uh, thing that young people have been taking up over in the last couple of years. It hasn't had years and years of research or data or um, analysis to be relied upon, like cigarettes, has it? Well, I think you'll you, you'd agree that any new drug that we release on the market doesn't have long-term data. And I think in the case of smoke, vaping, we have to compare the potential risks, and there may well be problems we find in the future, we've got to compare that against the known harms of smoking. We know that two out of three smokers will die if they continue to smoke, and I think there's some urgency to get vaping out there. Vaping is by far the most popular quitting aid in Australia. In spite of what was said earlier at this hearing, it's by far the most effective quitting aid. It is more effective without doctor's support than any other treatment. And that's why in Australia and in other countries, we're seeing uh, an effect from vaping in smoking rates. Uh, there was a study done uh, in Australia, uh, published in Addiction about three years ago, which found that as vaping rates were going up, the smoking rates and quit rates then, and quitting rates were significantly higher. There was an important study done a couple of years ago, a modelling study that looked at the Australian population and modelled the effect of introducing vaping, allowing for the harms from vaping, the benefits from vaping, the harms to children, they found hundreds of thousands of lives would be saved and quality of life years preserved if vaping had been allowed to be regulated like it is, for example, in the US. But I think we can do a lot better than that. Yes, no further questions, Mr Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Can I just add a supplementary to that? Yeah, but sure. Just, so isn't that just giving up one addiction to go to another? <laughs> no, look, it's not. And what it's giving up is a deadly addiction that kills two out of three users. That takes 10 years of life on average from people. It kills 8 million people in the world every year. And replacing it with a harm reduction alternative, so that's a much safer alternative that won't kill people, that gives them a tiny fraction of the chemicals but keeps them off the deadly option. And to me, and that's harm reduction. It's replacing a deadly option with a much safer alternative. No, we're not stopping nicotine, but we're stopping people from dying. Okay. And Thank this you. is for people who can't otherwise quit. Right. So uh, it, it's just harm reduction. Mr. Vo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Colin Mendelson for coming here today and um, uh, being part of the hearing. And uh, thank you for, for uh, all the information. And I, I realize you've been in the industry of tobacco harm reduction for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we may not always agree, but I, I thank you, you for coming to give a different view on, on this. And uh, thank you for being uh, such a respectful, um, uh, calm uh, witness. Like, um, my question is, um, your submission states that nicotine is especially um, beneficial for young people with ADHD, mm -hmm. attention deficit hyperactive mm -hmm. disorder, improving attention and brain function, mm -hmm. that's on page 10. This mm -hmm. appears to be at odds with evidence cited by many other stakeholders mm -hmm. who claim nicotine is harmful to a developing mm -hmm. brain. Why is your position uh, yeah. different? Look, I think there is, it's well accepted now that People with ADHD are much more likely to smoke. And the reason is that nicotine is a stimulant. And stimulants are the treatment for ADHD. And I ha have had many patients who've told me that 
once they found smoking, their ADHD improved. They can't stop because when they go back onto it, they get the ADHD again. If vaping was harmful to the adolescent brain, we would expect to see millions of adul adults now who smoked as young people with brain damage. We don't see, there's no epidemiological evidence for that. In people who've smoked, they've followed them up and looked at them as adults. They smoked as youth, and as adults, there's been no difference in IQ, no difference in educational achievement, no difference in cognitive function in different studies compared to people who didn't smoke as young people. Now, if smoking has no effect, how can vaping have an effect? So there's no, the evidence for, for vaping harming the adolescent brain is based on large doses in, 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 of chronic use of nicotine in animal studies. Now, the, the general feeling consensus is that that cannot be extrapolated to humans. There is no evidence in humans and like most animal studies, that's perhaps a signal, but there's no evidence that that can be extrapolated to humans. So I think it's purely speculative. The evidence doesn't support it. And just a follow-up question. So what do you think needs to happen for the prescription model to work effectively? The prescription model won't work effectively. So the prescription model has not has been rejected by the doctors, rejected by the pharmacists, rejected by the patients, the, the users. Um, the only way to regulate these products, I believe, is to replace the black market with a tightly regulated adult consumer product, product where people can buy from licensed retail outlets like cigarettes. So, and if you're a li you have a license to sell these products and you sell to a child, you lose your license or you have a huge fine. Um, and this is the way they do it in other Western countries. In New Zealand, they do not have a significant black market. Why would you? You could walk into a, a dairy, as they call them, or a, a vape shop, and get the, a, a legal regulated product uh, quite easily. You don't have to find the, the local dealer to provide these products for you. So there's no need for a black market, and these products are regulated. They're approved for safety and quality, and they're kept away from kids. There'll always be some kids who'll get them, but, um, but that's inevitable. Uh, but you know, if uh, the kids are mostly providing, getting products through the black market now, I think most of that will cease over time. Thank you, um, okay. uh, Doctor. No further questions. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Vo, and thank you, Doctor, for appearing before the committee you. Uh, today. You will be uh, provided with a copy of the transcript of today's proceedings for corrections, and the committee staff will also email any questions taken on notice from today and any supplementary questions from the committee. Thank you for your attendance. You. Members, the next witness is online. So when we're ready, we'll start. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I welcome our next uh, witness, uh, Professor Nicole Lee, appearing via WebEx. Um, thank you for appearing before the committee today to give evidence. Uh, please note that the committee staff will be taking photos and videos during the hearing. The photos and videos may be used for social media purposes on the New South Wales Legislative Assembly's social media pages. 
Please inform the committee staff if you object to having photos or videos taken. Uh, can you please confirm that you've been issued with the committee's terms of references and information, sorry, terms of reference and information about the standing orders that relate to the examination of witnesses? Yes, have you I have. received those? Okay. Uh, do you have any questions about this information? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. So as part of the formalities, uh, can you please state your full name and position and take the oath or make an affirmation? Thanks, I will be um, making the affirmation. Um, my name is uh, Professor Nicole Lee. I am the CEO of, in this capacity, the CEO of 360 Edge, which is a specialist consultancy in the alcohol and drug sector. Uh, but I also hold positions uh, as adjunct professor at the National Drug Research Institute at Curtin University and also as uh, CEO of Hello Sunday Morning, uh, which is an alcohol focused uh, treatment uh, provider. Uh, so. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, would you like to do the affirmation, please? Yeah, so um, I, Nicole Lee do hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Professor. Would you like to make a short opening statement before we begin questions? Uh, yes, I would. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, well, thank you first for um, the opportunity to appear today. As you know, tobacco is the leading cause of death and disease in Australia. So that's the leading cause but the risk from tobacco is not from nicotine. What makes cigarettes so dangerous is the naturally occurring chemicals in tobacco leaves and the chemicals that cigarette companies add to it um, for various reasons. So that's why e-cigarettes and vaping is significantly less harmful than tobacco cigarettes because they don't contain all of those dangerous chemicals from tobacco. Um, research estimates that vaping has less than 5% of the harm of smoking and less than 1% of the cancer risk. There's also very good evidence that e-cigarettes help people quit or reduce smoking and countries that have increased the availability of e-cigarettes have shown significant declines in smoking. Even in Australia, the latest data shows us that the la there's a large reduction in smoking the largest we've seen in, in decades, in fact, as vaping has increased in the last few years. So overall, e-cigarettes pose a relatively small risk for a very large public health gain in reduction in smoking. And most people who use vapes would buy them legally if they could, but the current models of availability, um, particularly the prescription only model, has restricted access so much that 90% of adults who use vaping products buy them illegally. The limited legal access to vapes has created a black market. And on the black market, products are unregulated, they're not tested for safety or quality, and they can easily be accessed by teens. Reducing access and increasing enforcement in the face of something that is of high demand is not effective uh, is not an effective approach to reducing the black market. And we have already learned this lesson from illicit drugs and many governments are starting to regulate these drugs properly through decriminalisation, diversion and legalisation for personal use. So on the one hand, non-prescription vaping products are being criminalised and then on the other, um, more harmful tobacco cigarettes carry no penalty. So we risk actually people going back to cigarette smoking, and that means we might see increases in cancer and other harms as a result in the future. We definitely don't want teens recreational vaping, but the best way to reduce access by teens is to increase access for adult smokers so they don't have to go to the black market. And uh, just finally, vaping um, in principle should be treated as a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. We'll now move to questions, and if I can uh, ask you the first question. Um, in your submission, it states that punitive approaches to vaping in schools are not beneficial um, in achieving behavioural changes. So how do we discourage the uptake of vaping and support young people with nicotine dependencies? Yeah, so if, um, if kids have nicotine dependence already, the best option for them is treatment. 
uh, and support. Um, in terms of prevention, we know that scare tactics and punitive measures don't work for anything. They don't work for alcohol, illicit drugs or for vaping. The best option is to provide good and early uh, education um, and uh, clear guidelines um, in schools uh, in terms of the use of uh, e-cigarettes and the consequences for that. Um, we know that things like uh, um, suspending or excluding children from school when they've used alcohol, illicit drugs or um, e-cigarettes or anything else um, actually increases their risk rather than reduces it. So overall, um, taking a more education approach, we know that when you give kids um, good information, uh, legitimate information that's factual, they tend to make um, much better decisions about um, drugs generally. Do you support schools that confiscate vapes um, uh, yes. without, without the punitive action yes. taken? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the one of the reasonable measures that schools can take is, um, you know, having having policies that vaping is not okay um, on school premises, and um, like many other things, they may confiscate um, them if they find them uh, without the punishment element to it. Okay, and what can schools do uh, to support? students that they know are um, uh, nicotine dependent, you know, they've identified students, uh, just confiscating the vapes by itself is not going to help that student, um, no. e even if there's repetitive confiscation. So uh, w what's your view on what's, what role the schools can play in helping that student? Yeah, I, I mean, I just reiterate your point that um, if someone is already nicotine dependent, just confiscating um, the equipment is not going to do anything. It, um, I think that the one thing to remember is that by far the majority of um, teens who try vapes only use them once or twice and then they don't use them again. Even those that use regularly um, don't use for very long and they don't use very frequently. There's a very small percentage who would be considered dependent, so dependent that they couldn't um, quit on their own. Um, we need to be sure that those um, teens that are using vapes are not existing smokers or pre-smokers because even though they are teens, it's still uh, it's still safer for them to be, if they're smokers, it's still safer for them to be vaping than smoking. Um, but if they're just recreational vapors, um, we have good, uh, good brief interventions and good treatment options um, for, uh, that are also apply to um, cigarette smoking, similar to cigarette smoking, um, that can be applied. And I think treatment um, generally for adults and for teens is the, the best way to reduce demand. Well, what about, we've heard uh, prior evidence that peer pressure plays a large role in terms of uh, young people taking up vaping. Um, you know, we've heard that uh, um, friends pressure particular students into trying the vape and then they get addicted, uh, you know, with the nicotine and so forth. So what what's your uh, advice on for schools, um, if you can give that advice, on to how to deal with the peer pressure aspect? Yeah, I look, I think this is why education right across the school is important and very early um, in an age appropriate way. Uh, because people, it, it, teens do kind of things spread, you know, fads spread through through teens, all sorts of fads. Um, and uh, yeah, so that so the education is uh, really important. Early education is really important and age appropriate education is really important. I think just remembering again um, that we shouldn't panic if if kids have tried um, vapes a couple of times because by far the majority of them have never used one mm -hmm. and uh, even those who try them don't use them very frequently. Um, so I think some targeted, some universal education uh, across the school and then some targeted into uh, 
intervention if a, a teen has, um, we know that they've used vapes. Thank you, Doctor. I'll move to Dr. McDermott. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Doctor, for being for us today. Um, as I've already said to uh, people who presented prior to, to yourself, um, this second day of hearing, we're hearing evidence which is at, quite at odds at times with what the hearing said the other day. I'm sure you're aware of that. One of the things, and it's been touched on by the Chair, that you talk about, you talk about in your submission is that punitive approaches to vaping in schools are not beneficial in achieving behavioural change. Now we've had evidence, and one in particular from a 16 year old who became addicted to vapes at 11. I put that to her, she said the opposite. She said that amongst her peers, having um, a punitive approach, having a, a weak suspension has, actually helps them to stop and refocus. So it's the opposite of what you've said. So. I'm just wondering, with your statement on page three, where what evidence have you used? Where have you got that from? So um, we we have a lot of um, research. So one thing to say is that individuals uh, may have different experiences, but we need to take a kind of more bird's eye view and look at the impact overall uh, of different measures. And um, we have a lot of research on uh, alcohol and other drugs, pharmaceuticals and illicit drugs, um, that is all quite consistent that shows that punitive measures, fear tactics, scare tactics, um, those kinds of approaches are not effective. Good factual information and education that's age appropriate is the most effective way um, to uh, address all sorts of uh, drug use, alcohol, pharmaceutical tobacco uh, and vaping uh, across the board. There will always be some people that don't respond to that, but overall that is the best approach to catch um, as many people in the education net as we can. So those who, those children which are addicted um, at that age, um, you in, look, I don't disagree with what you've put, and it's just I've put to you the opposite view, but they, you should. What is the avenue then? They're caught vaping. They take the product off them. You then send them to to medical practitioners to start counselling. Or what process would you follow? Um, I, I think that's all very individual. But um, one of the first things would be an assessment from a health professional. That would be a reasonable next step. Um, look, I think that um, parents play an important role, and they are um, at the moment very confused about the communication that they should be making um, to their teens as well. So not just education for the teens, but also for the teachers and for the parents is really important. Uh, if someone is dependent um, and wants to quit, then an assessment from a health professional is a good first step. A GP, for example, or um, a drug and alcohol professional or a quit, um, a quit facilitator. Okay. Um, you say in your submission, uh, it states that your strength on page five, that strengthening restrictions on the availability of e-cigarette products is unlikely to improve the current situation. Can you expand on that? Yeah, so look, we know from decades and decades of um, try attempting to manage a whole range of other drugs, that if, if, um, if there's a, a substance that um, people want, um, restricting it, criminalising it, um, making it um, hard to get, doesn't stop them using it. All that happens is that they go to the black market and a huge black market develops. Um, and that means the problem for me with the black market is that, um, that it actually makes it much easier for teens to access than, uh, than if they were legally available for adults. When we've put the teens uh, in evidence here, they've said that they really thought smoking was disgusting. They thought cigarettes and butts and that was filthy. However, they really liked vapes. So in a way, with having access to the black market or otherwise, giving them access or them, them using vapes, they, they wouldn't be using anything. They wouldn't be smoking at all, I'd put to you, if it wasn't for vapes. 
they wouldn't be taking that that they, they wouldn't be like I don't know what you like at school but what we saw when I was in school was as we'd sit in the toilets like these kids do with vapes we would do the same with cigarettes um, there'd be none of that um, and so my concern is that no matter what we do if those vapes are available um, and we've restricted it when I was a teenager when I was underage we could still get cigarettes easily enough it would be the same with the vapes so it's not going to stop the black market it's not going to stop uh, unscrupulous retailers still selling the cigarettes or having older people buy it for them it just means that they'll be taking vapes instead of the cigarettes so I put that to you well that's um uh, that's one possible uh, logical outcome but um, we don't know that that would be the case um, we have a really really good uh, legislative framework for uh, cigarettes for tobacco cigarettes that could be applied to vaping products and that um, that legislative framework has significantly reduced adult smoking and um, access by teens. And so the problem, the problem with that, that argument, which is very logical, um, Senator, is that uh, what happens, what happens with the black market is that it's actually easier for teens to access. And as soon as we start to control and regulate um, the market, give access to um, adults, then no adults are going to be buying on the black market and the bottom falls out of it. Uh, and so there's not that much around for teens to access. There will, as you as you alluded to when I was at school as well, uh, we weren't meant to be smoking, but um, there were many people who did try cigarettes. Um, but, uh, and there will always be some people yeah. who will find a way, but what we're trying to do is, you know, take a more public health view and um, regulating uh, properly is the best way to reduce access for the bulk of teens who um, are just trying it because it's there. So, so you'd regulate it like they would with cigarettes. Does that mean plain packaging as well? All of that. All that, that banning that, ads, um, all those yeah. things, taking it, okay. Right. Absolutely. You know, all, right. all of those things are effective that we've applied to cigarettes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other option is to make, um, that might be more kind of palatable to some people, is to, to make um, therapeutic access much easier. So at the moment, you have to go to your GP, mm. you have to, um, which is expensive. Um, GPs are, you know, over, uh, kind of under pressure and um, overworked, and it's really hard to get in to see your GP. It's just much easier and cheaper to go buy it on the black market. So if if that process was also um, made more available to um, to adults, also the black market would be significantly reduced as well. Okay. Do you think there'll be a reluctance by GPs to prescribe a medical nicotine like this this way? Currently, um, there is a significant. Um, reluctance among GPs we know to um, prescribe. They're getting a lot of conflicting information uh, about the safety of e-cigarettes and about who should be prescribed them. And so they're, they're very reluctant. Many of them are very reluctant to prescribe. Um, and, but, but if we are going to go down that prescription route, it needs to be much easier to access. Would it make sense to uh, expand um nicotine supply this way to pharmacists as well like you said it with say the flu injection and things like that now pharmacists take those things on or is there does there need to be a doctor involved rather than just a i know they're both doctors but rather than just a pharmacist you know what i mean yeah no i my personal view is that a pharmacy option is um is worth looking at um, I remember when we first had nicotine replacement therapy, so gum and patches and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we went through the same process. It was a very long time ago now, maybe 30, 40 years ago, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, initially you had to go to your doctor to get it. And then we realized that um, that wasn't working very well. And so it shifted into the pharmacy realm where, the, where there was some supervision by a, med by a medical health professional, um, but it was much easier to access. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Doctor. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. McDermott. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair, okay. and uh, thank you, Professor Nicole Lee, for coming and giving evidence today. Uh, thank you for um, providing us um, a, uh, a another view. Like you know, it's good for us to to um, hear you and uh, and probably make better and more accurate uh, legislation. <coughs> My question to you is: uh, Your submission states that the overall public health benefits of e-cigarettes are likely to be considerably greater than potential harm. That's on page three. Uh, why do you believe this to be the case? Um, primarily because the main harm from uh, vaping and from e-cigarettes is dependence on nicotine, uh, assuming that um, there's a regulated supply. So at the moment when the black when you buy on the black market, you don't know what's in it, and there could be all sorts of contaminants and things. But if we were to regulate properly and uh, manufacture it properly, and people just got the nicotine without all of the other crap in there um, that is in the unregulated market, then we know that um, there's not the, the, the the chemicals, the dangerous chemicals that are present in cigarettes. Um, and the main risk is dependence on nicotine. Now, dependence on nicotine is a, a pretty benign thing. 95% of cigarette smokers are dependent on nicotine. Um, and it, it's not, a, um, it's not um, in the same way, it doesn't have the same harms as some other drugs like say methamphetamine that has, if someone's dependent on it, there's a whole load of other social, mental health and physical health kind of harms associated with that. Uh, with um, vaping and nicotine e-cigarettes, um, it's really, uh, really the main uh, issue is uh, the nicotine itself. Um, so we don't get the risk of cancer, we don't get the risk of, you know, heart problems, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, and um, what needs uh, to happen for the prescription model to work um, more effectively, you think? Yeah, we. Uh, the, the number one thing is to ensure um, much easier access for, for adult smokers. So any way we can um, improve access um, to, to adult smokers, um, they will absolutely go, yeah, they would absolutely buy legally if they could. Um, and then that means that they're not buying in the black market, they're not supporting illegal production and um, that that will significantly reduce and also significantly reduce access for, for kids. So the, the number one thing is to improve access um, to e-cigarettes and vaping for adult smokers at least. Thank, thank you, um, Dr. N. No further questions, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vo. We have um, the member for Orange on WebEx. Uh, do you have any questions there, Phil? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor, for your evidence. I just want to ask you a few questions in relation to some of the things you've said today. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier in your evidence that uh, e-cigarette use is, is generally, especially amongst young people, uh, experimental and transient. Um, uh, that was that was in reference, I, I suppose, to uh, young people. Yes. Do you, do you have a view? Should is part of your um, idea in relation to reform or legislation around e-cigarette or vaping uh, that it should only be for adults, it shouldn't be um, children or people under the age of 18 shouldn't be able to access it? Is that is that your view? Um, in general, yes, that would be um, my view. The only exception is for teens who are already smoking and who are already de um, dependent on smoking. Switching to vaping for them would be um, much safer. Hmm. You said that, and your evidence was that kids that would generally try vaping um, may only use it, uh, would only use it frequently or, or, or not very often. Might be something they might try with their friends, with their peers, a few times, but then not partake in it to any degree of permanency. Is that was that what you meant by that? Yes, that's correct. So we already know, like from if you put all the data together from different um, different sources, somewhere between uh, two thirds and three quarters of young people have never ever had a vape. 
try even tried it once. So that's like the first thing to keep in mind. And then about 20% of young people have used at least once in the last 12 months, but the majority of those have used just a handful of times. Most of them try it once or twice and then um, don't bother with it again, because I don't know if you've used a vape, but it's not that good. It's pretty disgusting and it is a bit like smoking. Um, and then there's a, a small percentage of people, about five, five to seven percent who um, are regular users who are at um, high risk of becoming dependent on it. Yeah. Of course, we've heard evidence during the course of this inquiry about the, the, the level of, um, uh, of how addictive nicotine is. And obviously that's the risk that young people who, who, who choose to vape or, or, or get led down the path of vaping with their friends or peers. Uh, may in fact become dependent on it because of the, the nicotine issue. And obviously that has health implications as well. You're, you're agreeing, I'm assuming you agree with that? Um, the purpose of the, the Hansard transcript? Yeah, so um, the highest, the, the biggest risk for, uh, for people who vape is um, nicotine dependence. Um, but as I said, um, nicotine dependence um, in itself is a fairly benign dependence in when you consider all the other possible um, effects of drugs. Well, and I don't know about completely benign. I don't know about completely benign. Not complete. I don't mean completely benign, but relatively benign. Um, the the biggest risk from from tobacco smoking is not the nicotine itself. The nicotine just keeps people coming back for more, yeah. um, which yeah. makes which. Um, then all of the dangerous chemicals in it, they're just getting more and more of those dangerous chemicals. And that's not the case with um, nicotine, uh, nicotine vapes. But there's, there's, there's dangerous chemicals that have been found in nicotine vapes as well. Um, you agree? In, yeah, so now this is, this is the kind of, um, the tricky thing is that um, currently nicotine vapes are illegal, they're unregulated, and therefore nobody knows what's in them and all sorts of um, contaminants can be put into them without any controls. Um, then, it, but what I'm suggesting is that we move to a much more regulated um, uh, right. market, in which case people will know exactly what's in it. We can restrict um, any uh, dangerous chemicals um, in it. And then uh, the biggest risk is then just the nicotine dependence. And for people who are already smoking, they're already dependent on nicotine. Okay, nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, for appearing before the committee today. Um, you will be provided with a copy of the transcript of today's proceedings for corrections. Uh, the committee staff will also email any questions taken on notice from today and any supplementary questions from the committee. Thank you for your attendance. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, we'll now organise the next witness. Associate Professor Raglan Maddox, um, thank you for appearing before the committee today to give evidence. Uh, please note that the committee staff will be taking photos and videos during the hearing. The photos and videos may be used on the New South Wales Legislative Assembly social media pages. Uh, please inform the committee staff if you object to having photos and videos taken. Um, can you please confirm that you've been issued with the committee's terms of reference and information about the standing orders that relate to the examination of witnesses. Yes, 
I confirm that I've received those documents. Th thank you so much. Uh, do you have any questions about this information? No, Doc. Uh, no further questions. As part of the formalities, uh, can you please state your full name and position and then take the oath or make an affirmation? I can. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Raglan Maddox. Um, I come from the Bagamani Model Clan in Papua New Guinea and have the pleasure of leading the Tobacco Free Program at the National Centre for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Wellbeing Research. Um, I'll go into the affirmation. Yes, please. Um, I, Raglan Maddox, do hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Professor. Would you like to make a short opening statement before we begin questions? Yes. Okay, please. Um, thank you. I'll also begin just by um, uh, confirming that I don't receive any uh, vested interest money. Uh, I don't receive any money from the tobacco industry or the vaping industry. Um, consistent with Article 5.3 of the World Health Organization Framework Convention of Tobacco Control. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge and pay my respects to the, to the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we're meeting. Uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, the elders past and present, but also acknowledge uh, the youth and young people um, because they're going to be the leaders um, taking our uh, cultures, values, uh, beliefs forward into the future. And I wanted to acknowledge and respect um, those young people that have come to this committee and shared their, their truths and their stories. Um, in that note, I also wanted to acknowledge that, that health is not actually just the absence of disease. Um, health is um, much broader than that. We're talking about social, physical, mental, spiritual health and well-being, not just of the individual, but the community, um, the health of the environment. And so I think it's really important that when we're looking at things like our youth and our young people, the future generations to come, uh, that we leave um, Australia and New South Wales in a place that uh, fosters the health and well-being of our people. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge that this is a harm generating product. We have talked about that, you've heard about that over the last um, period, we've heard about that this morning. Uh, we've heard about the evidence around short term harms. Uh, if we know there's short term harms, we can be guaranteed that there's going to be long term harms. Um, evidence suggests that inhaling aerosol of any kind is generally, not, general rule of thumb, it's not great for us, it's not great for our health and wellbeing. Um, and I think communities have been saying that for a while now. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge the work of this committee in, in taking this step. Um, as you know, um, and as written in my uh, document, my submission, um, there is disproportionately high rates of tobacco use among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for a whole range of complex reasons, uh, including being paid in rations of tobacco as part of the colonial process. Um, but we do know that 70% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people want to quit smoking, 75% wish they never took it up. This speaks to the, the environment in which we live, where it's been socialised and uh, available on every street corner. Uh, but the majority of people quit cold turkey and the majority of people want to quit. So with the right supports, with the right infrastructure around communities, uh, we know that people will be smoke and nicotine free. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge and, and celebrate that work uh, in reducing tobacco use, um, but also look forward to um, the outcomes from this committee uh, in supporting youth and young people from, from not taking up e-cigarettes. Thank you. Thank you so much for those opening uh, remarks. We'll now move to questions, if I can ask the first question. You just stated that the vast majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, who smoke want to quit, and you've uh, indicated a figure of 70%, yep. and 75% indicated that they wish they've never uh, started. What, in your opinion, as a government, can we do to support um, those uh, wishes of uh, yeah, our Indigenous people in relation to smoking cessation? Um, I think there's a range of things. I think um, many years ago I started in this sort of, uh, in tobacco control about 2007, and I remember communities saying, stop selling it to us. Um, I go to the Aboriginal Medical Service, I go to the GP, I call the quit line, um, but I know that I can buy this product 24-7, seven, seven days a week at numerous stores. Um, so if I'm trying to give this up, uh, and it's a highly addictive product, as we've heard. Um, why is it available at every street corner? Um, we've known for over 70 years about the harms of tobacco, um, but it's still available as an everyday consumer product, which normalises that behaviour. Um, it normalises that. And we, we, as a society, tend to minimise the role of addiction, um, the challenges with addiction. We know how hard it is. Um, and so as a result, those 20-odd thousand Australians that die every year, I think just under 7,000 in New South Wales, um, 
it becomes uh, part of our everyday reality that we know people that will um, have tobacco related illness and and um, also tobacco related deaths. Um, so we know that 37% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people pass away um, due to tobacco use, 50% um, over age of 45. Um, and so in terms of passing on traditions, cultures, languages, um, the work across New South Wales, the work of um, land councils across here in celebrating, acknowledging the oldest living culture um, around the world is exceptional, but we have an opportunity to uh, reduce retail outlet availability as well as, um, you know, those personal choices supporting things like the quit line, GPs to provide um, cessation supports and other things. Um, but we know communities want to quit and we just need to, to get around and support them to um, be nicotine free. Thank you, Professor. Um, Dr McDermott? Thank you. You talked about availability then, mm. and it reminded me of how in certain states they've banned alcohol together in certain communities. Uh, is that what you're talking about, doing things like that? Um, y yes and no. Um, I think licensing is key. I think where communities have gone dry and it's a community-driven approach, I think it works. Mm. You know, the top-down approach doesn't necessarily work uh, and has other um, implications. Um, but we know at the moment, um, and I guess the, the privilege and, and honour I get to listen to community stories is um, they can't get their meds, they can't get bread, milk mm. and those things 24-7, but they can buy smokes. Mm. Okay. Um, they can get e-cigarettes. Um, you've heard about e-cigarettes being sold at retail stores around the state. Uh, we know you can get on Snapchat, Facebook, like we can probably order some here. Um, we know that people have been ordering them to schools. Um, and so that availability needs to change. Uh, the number of outlets where it's available um, needs to change um, for people to have an easier time quitting. We know that quitting is hard, um, but we can make it a little bit easier um, because obviously nicotine is highly addictive. Um, but if it's not available everywhere, it'll make those quit attempts a little bit easier, knowing that you don't have to walk past the person selling it to you. Um, and I'll just share the story. I, I, sort of, I was just <coughs> thinking as I was uh, coming up, um, the first focus group I did back in 2007 um, uh, down uh, in Queanbeyan, um, in the Eden Monero, the Venice of the Eden Monero, um, uh, the discussion was, I'm going to walk out of this medical service and I know that there are seven stores um, across the road there that will sell me tobacco and I'm going to try and give up. Uh, if I was on crack or some other product and you made me walk past my crack dealer to go to the medical service, I'm guaranteed to fail. So how do we change that power balance, um, particularly when we know that people are taking up these products as youth and young people, children, uh, and then having a lifelong addiction uh, where they're trying to give up. Um, but then we have a predatory industry, obviously marketing and selling a product and profiting at the expense of, our, of Australians' health and wellbeing. So how do we shift that? How, how many people in the Indigenous community actually vape, do you think? What's the kind of percentage? Do you have any idea? Um, yeah, you know, the, the, we, we heard about the household survey and other things, but we, mm. unfortunately, we know that that undercounts Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, I think we've sort of heard about a, a third of people. I think that's conservative. I think people have tried it, for sure. Um, we've seen a real explosion since COVID, I think, where people, you know, public health and other places have been caught up with other everyday realities and the ability to... Um, keep on top of the retail sector of, you know, a multi-million dollar industry is very hard. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm nervous about the next um, lots of um, national and, well, decent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data to come out. We expect to roll out a survey at the end of this year. Um, but I suspect it's, it's just over a third of people. So a significant amount. Yeah. And is it throughout the community or is it most of the young people? Is there a particular group or...? How's it spread? Uh, yeah, I think definitely young people, youth and young people. Um, social media has obviously been a, a useful vehicle for people to um, be targeted with. Um, I will also just give a couple of anecdotes because I, I do get to travel around the state and hear stories. And so when we're sharing some of the national data, I work with big data generally, uh, but it's really important to get the context right. Um, and so what young people have been telling us is that they don't know how to quit and actually taking up smoking provides barriers to them where they, they can quit. So at the moment when they're vaping, um, it's not an uncommon story that communities across the state have told me that they can vape anywhere. 
they can vape in the cinema, they can vape at home, they can sleep with it under their pillow, they can wake up at 3am and just suck on it and then get their hit and away they go. Whereas the reality is with smoking, you can't do that. You can't sit up in bed and spark up your cigarette and, and smoke without um, implications, without your parents knowing, without other things happening. Um, and so I think um, that normal uh, normalisation of it is one of those things we have to change. And so I, I actually just, when I'm talking about that, I will touch on the access thing, um, the access point that I think we've heard about this morning, uh, but throughout this um, hearing, is that it is available at every store, so why would you get a prescription? Um, if it's easier just to go down to the convenience store and pick one up, or walk across the street, which I'm sure we could probably do, um, and pick up a product, then why would I go to the doctor and increase mm. um, those barriers for me? So, okay. just a couple of thoughts. And are you finding people in the Indigenous community are using vapes as a way of coming away from cigarettes, or is it something different? Like, who, who it's talk about who takes it up, but is, are they using it as a minimisation plan? Um, the vast majority, no. No, the vast majority of, of people are youth and young people that have never smoked. And it's social, is it? It's social. Um, the messaging we're hearing from communities, it can't be that bad for us because it is available everywhere. Um, everyone's mm. doing it, we'll give it a go. Mm. Um, I think there are a number of people, um, and unfortunately I know when we're doing focus groups and interviews we hear these stories where um, people have been misled to think that this is a product that will help people quit. That, um, and I sort of mentioned those mm. barriers, and I appreciate that everyone's quitting or switching experience might be different. Um, but I've heard from countless people about the challenges they've faced using this product and then realising that they can use it everywhere, that there are no social barriers to it, and as a result, they start to suck on this thing a lot more than they would if they were smoking. Um, and then coming to me for asking advice around, OK, now how do I get off the vape? Like, I'm sucking on this vape constantly throughout the day, 24-7, not mm. just my waking hours. Um, so how do we provide those supports? How do we provide that structural support and also the, the social accountability? Um, and when I talk about social accountability, I'm talking about we've done a great job in Australia around the, to some degree around denormalising tobacco. So you can't smoke in this parliament. I'm sure mm. we could have at one point. Um, you can't smoke in the aeroplanes, all those sorts of things. Vaping isn't quite like that. I know we yeah. have vape-free legislation, but the enforcement of that is challenging. The social enforcement of that is also challenging. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Doctor. Um, uh, we have uh, the member for Orange online. Do you have any questions, Phil? Oh, look, yeah, just briefly. Thank you, Associate Professor. Look, I just want to ask you um, a couple of questions. Um, does the public health messaging need to be nuanced to target Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be more effective, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think that the reality is um, the implications are different. We know that the social determinants of health, those um, factors that um, put people at risk of tobacco use or, or vaping and other things are different. Um, and so we also know that the answers lie with communities. We know. I've heard from communities over the last couple of years, like how do we stop these vape stores popping up in our community? Um, how do we stop them popping up in throughout Western Sydney or wherever? Um, and so I think engaging with those communities and hearing um, what they want and how they want it addressed is, is incredibly important to make sure that it's culturally safe, like cultural safety is safety, um, but also um, it resonates with, with those people. And I think similarly, um, you know, we we're talking about supports for youth and young people throughout today. Mm. Um, Youth and young people know what will help them quit smoking or quit vaping, um, noting that, you know, we've done a great job with denormalising that. Um, uh, not a lot of young people are calling the quit line or going to see their GP to say, I've got an addiction issue. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important that they have a voice at the table um, in addressing those concerns so that they are used and used well, um, so that they're effective, sustainable. Um, and that's the, exactly the same principle. Um, around our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Yeah. You said earlier in your evidence there was a disproportionate use of smoking amongst Indigenous or, or vaping amongst Indigenous communities. Why do you think that that is the case? Oh, how long we got? Um, <laughs> yeah. About five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think um, I'll, I'll just go a, a quick um, context because I think it's important and we, we tend to gloss over it. Um, uh, 
obviously um, commercial tobacco was systematically embedded throughout Australia through the colonial process, um, particularly among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people being paid in rations of, wow, sorry, I thought I uh, put on an aeroplane mode. Anyway, um, so we know that it was systematically embedded um, through uh, rations of flour, tea, sugar and tobacco. Uh, we also know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were excluded from the cash economy and paid in those rations. We know they were excluded from the, the Euro-Western academic education system. So, you know, the civil rights movement in the 60s, 70s that saw um, the first Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from university and being able to go to university um, means that there is a significant difference in, um, in the way that people engage with Australian society. Um, we know that there are risk factors for tobacco use. We know that those risk factors for tobacco use, like income, education, stable housing, experiences of racism, are consistent with risk factors for vaping. Um, and we've got some research that we expect to come out, um, hopefully shortly, um, that highlights that they are consistent. Um, those patterns of addiction and other things are consistent. And so um, the way our society works um, as a system um, means that there are some areas for improvement, some gaps and some things that we need to address. So um, that's, that's fundamentally um, the challenges we're facing with. Um, does that make sense? Well, no worries, no further, thanks, thanks Associate <coughs> Professor. No further questions from me, Mr thanks. Chair. Thanks, Bill. Um, Mr Vo? Thank you, uh, Dr Raglan um, Maddox for coming today and giving your evidence, especially with your um, wonderful work with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Islander people and uh, my question is um, uh, how can um, school based learning about vaping be improved or delivered in a more culturally uh, appropriate way since you have a lot of uh, experience working with um, young people and especially Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people yeah thanks it's a, it's a great question I, I think we can probably learn some lessons from um, the Tackling Indigenous Smoking program that was implemented um, nationally around 2010, uh, sort of imp well, established in 2007, rolled out throughout from 2010, and, and basically it's um, locally driven um, processes to support um, communities to be nicotine free. Um, and those, you know, even around the table here, I'm sure we all know that our electorates are different, or your electorates are different. Um, the Edmund area is different to, to Sydney and other places. Um, and so how we engage with those schools and communities um, should differ according to that environment, but we can consistently roll out that information education, um, try and understand um, the needs of communities. Um, I think if we, oh yeah, I guess the, the context in, at the moment is regardless of where you live, there is retail availability and other things. So if we change that to denormalise it, then the, the school of the job of the schools, parents, teachers becomes a lot easier because there is that consistent messaging that this is a harmful product. Um, at the moment, we know um, teachers, parents, principals are, are reaching out because um, because it's uh, so, so pervasive um, and the messaging is complex and the commercial environment undermines their ability to teach or to parent because it is normalised that you know there are people that are vaping everywhere. Um, and so I think if we change that, then it becomes a lot easier for schools to say, here are the harms that we know about around vaping, here are the short-term harms. Um, uh, we might not necessarily know about all of the harms, but here's what we do know. Um, and so I think that that's a good starting place. We probably have also learned a lot of lessons from tobacco control more broadly. And I will just touch on this um, briefly is, you know, we've known about the harms for tobacco for over 70 years. We had uh, the US Surgeon General report come out in 1964 and we know it causes cancers, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, you name it, there's health implications for it. Um, so I guess I just question like how, how much more evidence do we need in that space? Um, and I guess we can learn from that to make sure that we do things differently in this situation. Thank you. And, and what, what one um, way of denominalising smoking or vaping is, uh, of course, to deal with uh, compliance and enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think we should um, paralyze the suppliers, the users, or both? Yeah, so, so I, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go down the path of criminalizing or, or um, penalizing people with addiction issues. I think that's a, 
you know, it's, a, it's an unfair society if we um, sell this product and then, uh, and then penalise the people for using the product and who are dealing with, with a whole range of issues. So I want to be very clear that I, I don't um, support that, but do acknowledge that it's complex. I think we do absolutely need to um, enforce uh, and create an environment that is conducive to health um, and needs to protect the health and well-being of all people, um, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including young people, including those generations that are going to walk this land after us and while we've, we've all disappeared. So um, I think that retail environment um, needs to change. Uh, I think the, you know, the, the predatory nature of of it and the commercialisation of it is what's actually harming um, Australians. And just for um, we uh, need to support young people, especially the Indigenous and the Torres Strait Islanders, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Your submission states that more financial support uh, is required to develop and deliver strategies uh, and programs to support Indigenous people who are nicotine addicted to quit vaping. That was on page uh, six. Uh, how should this investment uh, be targeted? Yeah, I, th I think like I was sort of saying, I think we, we've got a, probably a bit of a head start. We know um, that there are a number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, well, yeah, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live everywhere. So I guess that's my starting point, including in, in Sydney. Um, but also there are discrete communities across the state. Um, and the, the answers do lie within, uh, and we've seen with the Tackling Indigenous Smoking Program, um, that um, with appropriate investment and support that those communities um, uh, can change the narrative um, that people have been talking about. We, we sort of hear that with um, even the term black market is, is problematic. Uh, I guess we're talking about the illicit market. So just trying to think <coughs> about the way that, um, um, that the industry is so predatory in attacking um, communities and Australians. So uh, the communities that are being um, targeted um, know uh, the answers to addressing um, those challenges. Um, sorry, that wasn't very clear. Um, and so uh, I think if we go back to that and we use the infrastructure that's already in place, we know there are a whole range of community controlled health services, land councils that are doing works very successfully to reduce tobacco use. There's no reason why that wouldn't be different to um, reduce vaping use. Um, in addition to the systems approach to reduce retail availability and other things. So um, I guess in summary, there's no silver bullet. We need a multi-pronged approach um, to reduce tobacco, vaping uh, and other harmful products. And <coughs> so, so, so what are the, the risks associated with passive vaping? What action would you like the New South Wales government to take to ensure a high degree of compliance with smoke-free environment uh, regulations? Yeah, I think um, probably a couple of things, I guess. Uh, one is, you know, we're, we're talking about it here. I know communities have talked about it, but increased communication, um, awareness. Um, we know that communication campaigns um, are incredibly successful in, in generating those discussions. Um, we know at the moment that there's mixed messaging going out throughout communities um, through a whole range of resources, sources, including um, social media that essentially on one hand is promoting the, the product and we, we've even probably, an example from today is we've heard very mixed messaging um, come out of the committee so far. So um, how do communities actually understand or differentiate that, especially when um, some people are differently resourced to promote their messages? So I think good, clear, consistent messaging, national, regional, local approaches to communicate clearly that we know that this product is harmful. Uh, and try and minimise uh, secondhand uh, vape exposure, similar to the way we've done it with um, commercial tobacco use. Yep. And uh, my last question, uh, Chair, is: So, how can we ensure that the um, prescription-only model works properly for people trying to quit smoking, especially um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, I'll maybe just start with their whole range of evidence-based. Um, pharmaceuticals that the RACGP and others already um, provide advice on. Um, I think we know that Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services um, are doing a great job in supporting people to quit when they're coming in, um, but I think we can do better in terms of making those, you know, uh, patches, NRT, inhalators, um, uh, the mist, all those sorts of products um, 
uh, more accessible, um, increased communications. Uh, we know that uh, when we roll out communication campaigns about the harms of smoking, that there are increased calls to quit line, uh, people go to the doctor. So how do we provide that environment to support people to make a quit attempt, uh, but also have access to those evidence-based medicines um, to help them quit smoking, I think is um, really important. And we, we have a, you know, a tobacco strategy that sort of details some of those um, strategies and I think um, if we do all that as well as um, change the retail environment so it isn't available so widely uh, we'll see tremendous success and we can um, bring down the smoking rates and vaping rates uh, at a greater rate than we've seen to date. Thank you so much. Just no, one questions. question. If you sure. don't mind. Just one question to you doctor. Um, you talked about the predatory nature of the vaping mm. industry and tobacco industry. Um, has the vaping industry targeted Indigenous communities? Have they targeted the Indigenous people? Yeah, we, we know that um, uh, Big Tobacco have sent out letters to Aboriginal medical services promoting their products. Uh, their we've vaping seen, products, but, you mean? Yeah, e-cigarette products, yep. Um, so yes, uh, in, in addition to obviously we see um, retail stores popping up in Indigenous communities. Um, one of the... Um, I don't know if encouraging is the right word, but I had um, we had uh, quite a big turnout. Um, one of the interesting things around vaping is that when we go to and people ask us to talk about smoking, they want to know about vaping. And so we've had a number of community consultations where communities have just said, "Now, how do we get rid of these vape stores? Like they just keep popping up. How do we? How come we have eight stores here with a population of four thousand people?" Mm. Um, and so I think we, we do need to see that change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Professor, for appearing before the committee today. Um, you will be provided with a copy of the transcript uh, of today's proceedings for uh, any corrections. Uh, the committee staff will also email any questions taken on notice uh, from today and any supplementary questions from the committee. So once again, thank you for your attendance today. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, the committee will now break and resume at 1.15 p.m. Thank you, members.
Okay, we're right to go. I welcome our next uh, witnesses, uh, Mr. Martin Graham and Miss Megan Kelly. Thank you for your for appearing before the committee uh, today to give evidence. Uh, please note that the committee staff will be taking photos and videos during the hearing. Uh, the photos and videos will, may be used on the New South Wales Legislative Assembly social media pages. Please inform the committee should you not wish or object to having photos and videos taken. Now, um, can you please confirm that you have been issued with the committee's terms of reference and information about the standing orders that relate to the examination of the witnesses? Yes, you both have? We have. Yes. And do you have any questions relating to that information? No. Okay. As part of the formalities, can you please state your full name? and capacity you are appearing today and then take the oath or make an affirmation. I can start with uh, Ms Kelly first. Sure. Uh, so I'm Megan Kelly. Uh, with, I'm the Executive Director for Curriculum Reform with the Department of Education and I do hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Uh, Martin Graham, Deputy Secretary of Teaching, Learning and Student Wellbeing, Department of Education. And I do hereby affirm declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Okay. Thank you. Would either of you uh, like to make a short um, opening statement before we begin questions? Yeah, I do have a very short statement if that's right with the committee. Um, so I start by acknowledging that we're on Gadigal land today and I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. So our area of the department oversees the drugs in schools policy as well as drug education through the curriculum. Uh, so Ms Kelly chairs the department's drugs committee and is responsible for our actions and responsible to the vaping round table uh, which was hosted by the department in November 2023 as part of an election commitment by the government to address the growing problem of vaping uh, in primary schools and high schools. So we know vaping is having an impact on our students and members of our school communities. Uh, it's a significant issue raised by the community is how accessible those vapes are. And um, we also know that vaping is a community issue which will not be solved by schools alone. Uh, nicotine use and dependence through vaping impacts a student's ability to learn. So it impacts the ability to pay attention and behave appropriately in our classrooms and schools. We know it also affects their mood and their memory. So given those impacts, the department's commenced work on cessation support for young people alongside our prevention work. Uh, we also provide our teachers and leaders with curriculum resources and training to educate our students about the harms of vaping, explain how vapes are marketed towards and target young people, and teach the skills they need to make healthy choices regarding vapes. Uh, so we also work closely alongside our government partners, such as New South Wales Health, non-government organisations, including the Cancer Council of New South Wales, and so we take a well-coordinated approach to the issue of vaping. We also support schools to communicate with parents and carers about the harms of vapes, uh, their own school's policies and ways to support their children in relation to vaping. So in collaboration with the New South Wales PNC Federation, we delivered live webinars uh, to increase community awareness of the harms of vaping and other practical advice for parents and carers. Uh, specifically on the issue of vape detectors, uh, at our vaping round table, uh, detectors were strongly discouraged by most participants as the evidence indicates that the systems deter vaping only when complemented with human interventions, including education and support for students to quit vaping, which are the things we're concentrating on. Uh, we believe the introduction by the Commonwealth um, of the um, reforms around vaping accessibility will go a long way to reducing access to, for our students and other members of the community. Uh, in conclusion, we're committed to working with our Commonwealth state non-government colleagues to eradicate vaping, support school communities and to collectively help the health and well-being of our students. Thank you. Ms Kelly, do you have anything further? No, nothing further to that. Thank okay. you. We'll move to the uh, question session and I might just um, start by asking um, the first couple of questions. So um, first of all, is vaping education currently integrated into the primary and secondary school curriculum? Is it? So certainly is issues of um, <coughs> drug use and dependency and so on is integrated into the PDHPE syllabus. Can you talk about how we do that? Mm. Yes, please. And it is done in an age appropriate way. So making sure that uh, it's addressing those developmental understandings of students and building on those skills over time. Uh, and then additional resources and support are also being added to that. Um, so curriculum resources like teaching and learning materials, 
particularly around vaping, uh, to support uh, that curriculum uh, focus that's already there. And do you feel they make, that's making a difference? Uh, it's a good question to ask. I think over time we will understand the full impact of those resources. I think it is definitely giving students the information that they need um, about recognising the dangers, understanding those dangers. Um, as um, Mr Graham also mentioned in terms of uh, advertising, marketing, knowing that they're the target of that marketing, how to uh, respond to peer pressure. So it is the uh, curriculum focus, but it's also giving them those skills that they need to be able to manage the situations when they encounter them. So it's a, a broad approach that we take. Yeah. Given how quickly, I mean, it's only you know, 2007 vapes were invented, I think we've been much faster onto this than onto some previous things. And yeah. we've, we've started with health, so we're using exactly the same messaging, the same materials, uh, New South Wales has got comprehensive packages, particularly around high schools, um, and the National Wellbeing Student Hub actually uses the New South Wales materials. So, you know, we've always got more to do, and particularly within schools, each individual community is different, but we think, you know, we've made a pretty good start to it. We've heard um, earlier evidence that um, if students knew what chemicals are actually in the vapes, it might discourage them for continuing because they simply don't know. Um, it's just a peer pressure thing that they've engaged in. So does your curriculum go into um, educating the students about not just, you know, um, drug and uh, smoking being hazards, but that actually goes into why vaping should not be done because of these chemicals that they're inhaling? Does, does it go that far? It, it's a, it certainly does. I might let Ms Kelly give the detail, <laughs> yeah. but from, from my perspective, reading through our materials, I learn a lot about the chemical compounds, and when you talk to kids in schools, they are way more educated on this than I think the rest of the community. They'll, okay. they'll be able to talk about the acetate in them, they can talk about the you know, different compounds. So I think, I think we have been a bit quicker. Mm. And we have used the New South Wales Health campaign, which is called Do You Know What You're Vaping, yeah. uh, to build some of our resources on. So yes, we are absolutely um, helping our students to understand uh, the contents of vapes and then the effect of it on, on their health. In relation to teachers, um, what professional development do teachers get to uh, deliver vaping education modules? Yeah, so there is quite a bit of professional learning that is available for teachers. So we've got things that are online, um, modules that they can work their way through um, from understanding vaping uh, and the knowledge that they need around you know, what vaping or what vapes are uh, to how to teach those materials and then how to support students, importantly, for those students who are vaping, how do you then support those students to access um, the health um, support that they require. So it is comprehensive. We've added to that recently this year, so there's new, um, new professional learning available for our teachers. Thank you so much, uh, Dr McDermott. <coughs> thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, your evidence is really important to us and you um, and certainly, you know, myself and the member for Mount Druid spoke first were contacted by principals of our schools five or so years ago and it started building a bigger and bigger problem. So um, <coughs> it's been put to us that it's a health crisis amongst youth in our schools. Would you agree with that? I'd certainly think it's a rapidly growing health issue. I guess we'll leave it to the health people to define it by crisis. It's certainly absolutely a health issue that's been identified in all schools and we're absolutely approaching it as a health response. Yeah. Okay, so your response is a, a health response, not a Ab disciplinary response? It's absolutely a health response and so in any, um, which is important, so if we do take any kind of action because, you know, there's a lot of vaping going on, you know, the direction is not just about the education for why you shouldn't vape, but also um, moving them on to cessation, like so helping them to get mm. off the vapes, like that's a that's a really important part of the health response. So can you talk me through the process? So I'm a student or a group of students. Yep. They're socialising probably in the bathroom with uh, the vapes. They get caught. Yep. What then happens? Well, talk so, me through the whole process. Yeah, so the reason, so we, so first, the first part of the process is it's now absolutely clear in the student behaviour code that vaping is absolutely not permitted in mm. school. And you think, well, why is that important? Often that behaviour code is put by schools perhaps in a diary or some other thing or it's reinforced in assembly or it's in a newsletter right at the beginning of school term. So those expectations are clear. So when the students are doing that, it's very clear that they're breaching the student behaviour code and that they're not meeting the expectations of the school. Now, we give principals a, a lot of discretion because it will depend. How old are the kids? Have they done this a lot before? You know, what are the risks? And it's really around the risks. So the principal will say, 
you know, well, what are the risks I'm managing here? Am I managing a group risk that there's like, this is going to so expand to other kids? So it's yeah. a risk model it's based risk on model. the policy of the department? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, on, yeah, no. And so we, we're clear yeah. to principals, they do get discretion, but we've yeah. also been clear in our behaviour policy yeah. that vaping is something they should take seriously okay. and they can take action for it. Now, if they have a um, particularly difficult situation and they need time to um, bring that under control, to bring in risk mitigation, that's the time at which you may consider something like a suspension. But there's no kind of automatic if you vape, you're suspended. Because okay. it's, you know, they might be the kids who need most to go to the counsellor because they know they've been trying to get them off and the parents a bit, you know, there's so many different circumstances. We give um, the principals the discretion to be able to put the risk management in place to minimise the risk of harm to other students or to um, mm. staff. And that's it? They're not referred to counselling. They're not oh, no, referred so to bring the parents that, in. Part or of what? That Tell me the process. process. So, well, it's, it's, why it's, it's different for each school depending okay. on what's happened. But the process could be they bring the parents in because it is yep. a health issue, and we, are, you know, speak to the parents about do they need advice and support with getting the kids off the vapes. Um, you know, uh, often kids are vaping because of other underlying issues. So we know mm. anxiety, eating disorders, things like that yep. are often quite closely related to that behaviour. So we absolutely want to address that root cause. We're not a primary health provider. We do have counsellors in schools and so on, but they're not providing long ongoing therapy. Right. So they might work with them. The other thing the principal might do is go, okay, we really need to hit those department vape resources. Let's get on the website um, and let's talk about what we're doing for, um, might be year eight that's a particular mm. issue in. And we might use the PDHPE class as a time to talk about that in year eight. So they might go individual student, group, whole <coughs> school, depending on the circumstances. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not a neat, simple thing, but it's absolutely, right. what is the risk, who is it to, what can I do about it? Okay, and is it the same model for if they were caught smoking cigarettes? Yep. So they're identical? Absolutely the same. Okay. Yep, absolutely right. the same, taking the same. Okay, so it was put to us today um, in evidence that, um, that perhaps what you need to have within each school uh, is a, a vaping area for those kids who are addicted to the nicotine. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, it was the same. And discussion. why not? It was the same discussion that was had about cigarettes, and so we're very clear: adults, children, um, contractors. There's no smoking and no vaping on any government school site. Okay. So it's and we've yeah, and that's the same issues were discussed with smoking, and it's the same. You know, if you start the grey zone of oh, we have a safe space, it, it just makes it too difficult for schools to manage that. To manage it. Yeah. But what about the welfare of the child? We're absolutely concerned about the welfare of the child. But we believe there are ways of, we would rather, you know, have medical advice about how to manage that addiction mm. um, than have them bringing the vapes onto the school ground. Okay. Yeah. But we know, we, know that is, we know that is challenging. Yeah. Okay. Um, this discretion you should give to the principal and this risk-based approach, which is obviously what you're doing, do they then report that to the, the education department that they've found so many students that week or what the process is? Most of the data is local, but if there are incidents, mm. we have an incident reporting system and that is all logged centrally and comes through to the department. Okay, so you have a database of not finding we, out incidents? We have a database. It wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't, I can't tell you it's got the fidelity of picking up every time someone's seen a vape. It might no. be reported as an illicit substance rather than particularly a vape. Um, but we, you know, so it's managed locally at the school level. But the reason we have all the resources is the health data is very clear. It's in every community, it's in every school. It's, you know, we don't need, um, uh, it's, it's the materials available to schools. The principals know best whether they're having an outbreak in their school. Yeah, yeah so but you're not really not answering what I'm asking of you, right? And what I'm asking yep. is what the whole process is. Now, yep. I've been spoken with ad nauseum by, by principals of different yep. schools in Western Sydney about the problems they've got with vaping, yep. have for many years. And what I'm trying to say, what is the responsibility of the department? What do they do? Now, just saying, oh, it's back to the risk of the, of the principal. No, no I want you to tell me so, so what in, happened okay, so I know. So in, in developing our new behaviour policy, yeah. the previous one didn't include vaping right. in it. And we've listened to those principals and we've worked with them. And so we've absolutely made it clear their authority. Some of them didn't know, like, well, I'm allowed to do anything about it, I'm not mm. allowed to do anything. The behaviour policy is now very clear. You absolutely can include vaping as a serious thing to deal with. And if you needed to suspend a student, you're absolutely entitled to do that under that policy. Right. But it absolutely doesn't say that you have to, yeah. because of course principals know their kids best. Which is fair yeah. enough, yeah. that yeah, makes yeah, a lot of that. sense. So, so that makes the department's sense, responsibility so, yeah. is also to provide that material, and um, you know, we can provide you with the links. That it is expert material with health, um, 
I've educated myself a lot just using our own department's materials, mm. absolutely on us to give them the tools they need uh, so their expert teachers can deliver that education. And I think that's something the department definitely does. We're now doing it for Australia because we're doing it quite effectively. Um, school counselling and referral to health services for the cessation is the other really important thing. Mm. Um, you know, and, that's, and they're the things that we um, have been doing and I think they're starting to so uh, be a lot more effective. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. It, yeah. So if the committee asked you, can you give us some data about how many reports are coming back to the department, how much, say, one suburb is to another or where the hotspots are, can, are we able to do that? It would mainly be health data that would do that. Health, we, okay. we ha yeah, we have incident data, but it, it's um, uh, it's this trade-off between, you know, how much admin burden for the principal, yeah. if we ask them to log every single little thing. Yeah. But, you know, we do, we certainly have enough of a sense that it's everywhere and we need to do something about okay. it everywhere. All right, yeah. well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, now, um, I, I imagine you didn't mention this, but <clears throat> you would seize the, the vapes or the cigarettes oh, yeah, or whatever other yeah. drug that gets caught. Absolutely. Um, so you basically seize the vapes. Now, obviously, safe storing of these vapes is an issue. I've heard all kinds of reports also from my yeah. schools and my electorate regarding fires, other things like that. What's the process of storage what's the process regarding safety of when they do seize these vapes it, look it is a challenge i think it's a challenge like all kinds of e-waste and it is unfortunately fairly localized how that's managed because e-waste in particular is often managed through uh local councils and local um you know refuse collection contracts and so on mm. so yeah we know it's not straightforward but it's a similar problem to lithium batteries um we have lots of robots and things in schools now where we mm. have that kind of issue as well so so what is the discretion within each department uh, each school to how they dispose of it we, we can give them professional advice but it, unfortunately it's not as simple as um your department doesn't have a statewide collection system for um, yeah, that's the type of thing stuff. i'm asking you what yeah no the, we don't have a statewide collection yeah. system because it's localized and that's partly because they're kind of the refuse system is localised in in New South Wales, so right. that, that does. Yeah, it's a okay, challenge. so the principals have to, the schools have to deal with it themselves. Correct? Uh, well, but with with advice from the department, we can help. You want to say something? I oh, know. I was just going to say that we would advise them to contact their local councils. Okay. Essentially, yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah. And that's what they do. Yeah, there's a challenge. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, that's all the stupid questions I've got. Thanks. Thanks. Doctor. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Sorry. And uh, thanks, Ms. Megan uh, Kelly and uh, Mr. Martin Graham for coming here today. Your evidence is going to be very important, uh, part of the uh, Department of Education. And a lot of uh, the users in this case are, are young people, and uh, a lot of them are in, in high school. So your evidence is very important. Thank you for coming today. Just want to ask um, how prevalent um, is vaping in New South Wales schools? And how is this detracting from teaching, uh, for, 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 from the teachers teaching and the students learning, and uh, also uh, to, to our, our young people looking to the future? Like, uh. Well, I think that the health data, I think, is about one in six, but we know that it's not consistently one in six across the state. And certainly within a school, um, we know there'll be whole classes who aren't vaping, and then there are whole kind of social groups who are. And it's, the students are very cl the students are probably clearest with us about how that works. When you speak to students, they know um, how that's happening. We know the kind of effects of particularly the nicotine. We know about the kind of they're not often marketed as having it, but we know that they do have it. Um, and the the head spins and the other medical effects are real. It does at, at its most acute can distract from the class in that students will have medical episodes and might need to go to the sick bay or have some other assistance if they have trouble breathing. That's at its most extreme. That's not incredibly common, but it certainly can happen. Um, certainly they're not vaping in class, but we would be worried about any kind of um, absenteeism that was maybe driven by um, kids needing to vape elsewhere. Um, so that can also be an issue as well. So we know that it's... Um, it is pervasive in communities, and as long as it's in communities, we're going to be dealing with it in schools. Um, we don't want to see them, obviously, education is a fantastic place in that we have everybody, and we know we've got them for these precious years, um, and we can give them the tools, not just to deal with vaping, but to deal with whatever next comes along when they leave school. And we think that's one of the reasons why we don't just tell them about vapes, we tell them all about peer pressure, marketing, um, all that stuff, how to resist it, um, because then something else comes along that we haven't thought of yet, uh, you know, they'll be equipped to deal with it. Yeah, thanks so much. And you mentioned about peer pressure. Yeah. My question is, um, are you aware of uh, peer-led vaping prevention programs being trialled in New South Wales schools, for example, engaging older students to become vaping prevention advocates? And what is your view of, of this approach? 
So we, we've got a, we, we're very excited by those approaches. We've got an arrangement with um, Western Sydney Health where we're working to develop a professional learning package where year 10 students uh, will be working to um, uh, help inform their year seven, particularly as they're coming into secondary school, uh, inform them about vaping and so on. I was lucky enough to be in our building in Parramatta and I just happened to be walking past the room where we had health and students from government and non-government schools and they were helping to um, work with health about what would be influential on kids, like what is influential on their peers? Um, you know, what does social media, what does TikTok look like? And um, they were starting to develop that program together. And I think that particularly how quick vaping's taken off, uh, a lot of the teachers, um, you know, there was no vapes when they were in school. So we are very excited by the peer thing. We still yeah. think absolutely Department of Health professors, proper, you know, evidence-based stuff is really important. But if we can build on that and use peer coaching as well, we think that's a, a, an addition to that model would be really powerful. And the kids themselves are really excited by it. Mm. I, I, that's what I mean. I think compared to smoking, the students are way ahead of us on this one, which is really heartening. And I think in addition to that point, the way we deal with e-cigarettes is different to smoking in some ways. And so student voice here is really important for us to understand what's going to work in this situation. Mm. Um, to be able to better address it because it, it is a different problem to solve. Cigarettes were seen as dirty and it was a bad habit, whereas this is a bit, you know, vaping is seen to be a bit cool. And so it is understanding what, what will it be that makes that difference and how do we use our students to be able to influence that with their younger peers is an important piece of, um, of addressing this issue. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> so, so how, how are the schools supporting we're talking about the peers here, but here and we're talking about the parents. How, how are schools supporting parents mm. and carers uh, to have informed conversations with their children about the um, the risk of uh, vaping? Mm. So we've been so we've um, uh, statewide. We've done things like have webinars with the Federation of PNC, so they can bring parents in. We had Dr. Kerry Chant at it. We also had um, someone, a young person who'd recently given up vaping. So it's really helpful to talk to parents about, well, what is it that would influence lung, young people um, around that? Um, but we're also, you know, schools are obviously, people are particularly, we knew during COVID, pe people look to their local school as a source of authority. So mm. we provide schools with information for their newsletters and so on, so they can help educate the community about what they're doing in schools about vaping and can help them talk to their kids. Yeah, because it is important parents you know it's a partnership between uh, schools and, and parents and in many instances parents aren't aware of the dangers themselves of vaping so yeah they're learning along the way um, mm. and and they're looking out they're asking for that support to be able to uh, explain it to their children and to protect their children so yeah we take very seriously that role in in providing that um, education for our parents as much as we are for our students and is it like um <clears throat> it's, it's quite difficult to talk to the parents and the students, but um, so h how do you approach it? Like, say, um, h how do you approach the issue? Like, is it uh, more like uh, educational or information a a awareness, or is it there to to help the child or to punish the child? H how do you approach um, situations like that? So, it's, so it's informational. So they've got the same information that their yeah. kids have, but but yeah, that's the. the the biggest question from parents was, how do I start to talk to my kids about this? Um, and it does differ, obviously, with the age and so on. One of the things we're aware of, and we're really age sensitive, is, you know, one of the risks is if you just start flooding everyone with vaping information in year five, are we going to get an uptake of vaping because we've suddenly started talking about it when the kids might not previously have been talking about it? So we work with parents about when's an age-appropriate way to talk about it and what you might talk about what's a non-threatening way to talk about it. Some of, the, some of the advice we give on every issue is the classic, you know, talk about it in the car, you know, when everyone's facing forward and you don't have to have the confronting, you know, looking into each other's eyes. And some of those are really simple techniques, but um, they're the powerful things that were shared during the PNC webinar. And depending upon the context too, you might manage a conversation with a parent in a different way. If it's a student who is vaping, then you, you'd invite the parents in and have those conversations. And yeah, so I think it does depend upon the situation. So there's that general support, but then there's more targeted uh, support as well when it's needed. Yeah, and my last question is, um, is uh, <coughs> a teacher, a friend of mine said, uh, vaping detectors in the toilets are not that useful. 
uh, <clears throat> do you think they're useful or are they more uh, useful ways of detecting or, or supervising the children um, not to use um, uh, vapes or e-cigarettes? The, the strong feedback we had from the round table, and that was young people, principals, um, health professionals, everybody was, um, they're just not a magic solution. So they might detect vaping, but you also need to have adults going around and checking, which you need to have anyway. And it kind of gave people a false sense of security. Oh, I've done something about it. But in fact, it's kind of a really minor thing. We would never say no. If a principal had a really specific situation, they're absolutely welcome to um, do that and would help support them to do that. But yeah, the, the other messaging was, of course, you just get them damaged. Um, people flush them down the toilets. It's just like, it just creates an extra layer of problem. And the one that um, was brought to us by the young people and the health professionals was suddenly a trend to try and hold the smoke in your lungs to uh. avoid the detector, which is just, you know, that's just making things way worse. So, yeah, in the end, our advice was um, not a wide rollout of detectors, but if a school wants to use them and they have a really specific need and a place, it might be a supervision issue, then, you know, we'll support them with that. Yep. So your teacher friend was absolutely spot on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tree. No um, we have uh, the member for Orange online, I think. You there, Phil? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, up Nick, can you see and hear me both? We can hear you, can can't see you. See you. Oh, righto. Okay. Maybe that's a good thing. Hey, um, listen, both of you, I just wanted to ask you uh, a couple of questions and feel free. I'll, I'll direct to you, Martin, but uh, yeah. Megan, oh. if you feel more appropriate for you to answer, by all means, answer it. Um, are either of you aware of any vaping related safety incidents that occurred at any schools, either kids being hospitalised or having to be um, treated by ambulance or or any other injuries that have been sustained whilst they've been vaping at school? I don't have specific instances, but I certainly know that it has happened. I don't have kids' names, but I certainly have heard of incidents. Um, I think particularly kids who are vulnerable, perhaps had asthma and so on. And I guess there's always the question of, was it the vapes and so on? So I guess I don't have a, you know, exact clinical um, you know, diagnosis. Are you, are you, are you able to take one notice and provide a written response to this committee, um, Mr. Gray? Yeah, I can. I can see what we've got on that. But yeah, as I said, sometimes the incident data won't I exactly identify that. But I can certainly see yeah. what we've got. Well, we don't need um, children's names. No, no, no. Just number that. of incidences. Yeah. Yeah. Surely there'd be a report at the school of an incident like that, wouldn't there? Uh, the, well, the question might be, um, you know, uh, did they refer to it as a vaping incident? Was it something else? But we'll, we'll certainly look into that data. Thank you. The roundtable discussion that you said was had, I think, last year, um, the, va the vaping roundtable, um, what were the recommendations or findings that came from that? Yeah, there were uh, quite a few recommendations that came out of that. Um, many of those actions were already underway and so um, it's just uh, ensuring that we're delivering on those. Uh, one of those recommendations was to bring the education and the resources and support down to a younger uh, age group. So we had been looking at um, high school students specifically, so bringing it down to our years five and six students, so that work is underway. Development of a guide for our, our teachers, so we've already got a whole lot of advice, but consolidating that into a guide that they can use the additional professional learning, which has already gone live. Uh, linking our resources and support to the latest health campaign, uh, so that work is underway. Um, are you able, sorry, Mrs Kelly, are no. you able to provide perhaps uh, this committee, uh, I'm not saying now, but um, yep. in the next seven days, a copy of those recommendations that have you, know, or, or you can take that on notice. Yeah, and they are published yeah. on our website, so they're, they're um, yeah, publicly we available now, yep. but we can, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, and thank you both for appearing before. Can I just ask one more yeah, question? Yeah, one more question. Sorry, it's always waiting. <laughs> um, I'm always doing that to the Chair. One last question. So. Obviously, there's been a lot of work you're dealing with, obviously, tobacco, but also with, with vaping from the department. Just, you probably can't answer this, but if you can, um, how much educators' time or resources do you think are spent at each school dealing with this vape problem? I think it would be very hard it would, to quantify. It would vary. Just give me your opinion. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't quantify it. I, I would say, look, some of it would be we've displaced concerns about cigarettes onto it, so not additional time, just a different concern. Yeah. What we would say is what we're really passionate about is in providing all this support, we'd like to say, 
uh, there's been no time having to think, oh, what kind of resources am I going to need for this age group? How am I going to do it? Because we've provided them. So I guess we do know it takes time. We're passionate about reducing admin load for teachers, reducing the cognitive load for them. And so, you know, that's what we would say is like actually, you know, it, we're trying to minimise any additional time. They're going to have PDHBE classes anyway. This kind of stuff's in the curriculum, but how do we give them the vape-specific elements so they don't have to develop all that themselves? Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I probably haven't asked you. No, no, it kind of is because it's a, it's a yeah, that's question. Yeah, so. It would be that's different for different to. roles in a school yeah, too. Yeah, so yeah. if you're a, a head teacher welfare, then yeah. you might be spending a bit mm. more time on it than a classroom teacher, for example. Mm, so, yeah. it, Which is part of why it's hard to quantify because it looks yeah. different for different, um, different roles. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Once again, thank you both for appearing uh, before the committee today. You will be provided with a copy of the transcript of today's proceedings for corrections. Uh, the committee staff will also email any questions taken on notice uh, from today and any supplementary questions from the committee. Thank you for your attendance. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, committee staff will now organise the next witnesses. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for your attendance and I welcome our next witnesses, Assistant Commissioner Scott Cook, APM, Dr. Kerry Chant, Ms. Gemma Broderick and Professor Tracy O'Brien. Thank you for appearing before the committee today to give evidence. Please note that the committee staff will be taking photos and videos during the hearing. The photos and videos may be used on the New South Wales Legislative Assembly social media pages. Please inform the committee staff if you object to having photos and videos taken. Now, can you um, uh, please confirm in turn um, if you've been issued with the committee's terms of reference and information about the standing orders that relate to the examination of witnesses? And we'll just go, Ms. Gemma, yes. 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 yes and you. yes. Thank you so much. And do either of you have any questions about this information? No. No. Okay. As part of the formalities, uh, please first state your full name and the capacity you are appearing today, and then take the oath or make an affirmation. And we'll start um, with uh, uh, Ms. Gemma. Gemma Broderick. I'm Acting Executive Director of Legal and Regulatory Services at the Ministry of Health. Um, and. I hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I'm Professor Tracy O'Brien. I'm the New South Wales Chief Cancer Officer and the Chief Executive Officer of the Cancer Institute, New South Wales. Um, I'm also a conjoint professor uh, in paediatrics and child health at UNSW. Um, I uh, do affirm and declare the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Dr Kerry Chan, I'm the Chief Health Officer and Deputy Secretary for Population and Public Health New South Wales Health and I 
Kerry Chant do hereby affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Scott Cook, Assistant Commissioner of Police, uh, attached to the st um, State Intelligence Command. Um, I, Scott Cook, swear that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you so much. Um, do either of you or all of you have a um, short opening statement before we begin questions? Um, we've not prepared, from New South Wales Health, we've not prepared a statement. Sure. We really wanted to um, allow the committee to have the full um, time for sure. questions. Uh, no, thank you. No, okay. So we'll move um, to questions uh, from the committee. And I've, uh, I'll start with a couple of questions. First to um, health. So according to the recent media reports, New South Wales um, Health launched only 12 prosecutions for illegal vapes sold over 18 months. What's preventing New South Wales Health from securing more convictions? So I would uh, respond by that to say that our regulatory activities got a number of um, components. So first of all, um, in a number of those cases, we will have seized the product, and so one of our intents of our compliance activity is to remove um, remove product from from sale, and that in itself has a, a burden to the re ha has an impact on the retailers. We also have the ability to um, um, initiate pin offences, so that's. Um, um, on the almost like an on-the-spot fine for some offences, and in others we lodge um, a, a activity in terms of the formal legal processes. There does take a time for us to um, lodge those um, those cases, and we work with our colleagues in regulatory in um, legal services to ensure that the prosecutions are robust and support our officers take them to through the court um, system. Um, just a follow up on that, uh, we've heard earlier evidence today of a retailer set up in a candy shop near opposite the school. Um, I think it's been in the media, um, that particular uh, retailer, yet nothing's, no action's been taken in relation to that retailer. So if the committee would like to give me the details of that retailer, we will be happy to initiate compliance activity. We have a system where we receive intelligence from members of the public and from other sources. We have an ability to um, go to our website, complain, and we use that, um, that intelligence. We'll obviously prioritise things that are concerning, particularly if there's concerns around sale of the product to minors, um, those types of issues. So very happy to follow up that, um, that premise, and I would just like to to ask all retailers to act responsibly at this time. Yeah, is what's what's the process for the public? Um, if the public um, identify a particular retailer selling to minors, um, is there a process uh, that so the public can go through? If they go to our website, there is um, a link, and they can make a complaint online. That's probably the most efficient and effective way for them to complain. Yeah, but if going online is too difficult, is there... Like there a is phone, actually a, a number phone? as there well. Is. Um, and they can also ring their local public health unit, which is a 1800 number. And I'm happy to provide those details to the committee yeah. and for the committee to disseminate that. But how that. could that information be um, given to the public? Remember, um, remember the campaign, dot by litter person and that sort of stuff? Sort of There's nothing available in that s uh, sphere of... Uh, you know, the illegal retailers operating that people can dob a retailer. We have put that in some of our um, uh, social media posts and our media about how to make a complaint, but I take it on, you know, on board that you're reflecting that we haven't done that adequately enough to reach the group. Yeah. So we, we will take that on board and reflect on how we can get those Messages. complaints um, yeah. to, the, to the community and to the different segments of the community. All right. Um, Dr. Chan, um, you, are, you are aware that the federal government is currently um, in the process of doing legislation uh, in relation to um, implementing, uh, you know, controls over vaping uh, probably later this year. Um, who will be responsible for ensuring compliance of the retail? Will it be the state government's responsibility once those federal legislations are in place? 
There are a number of um, regulators and so various entities will take um, have a key role in, in different components. So, for instance, the Australian Border Force yeah. will be um, tasked with maintaining the vigilance at the border mm -hmm. and ensuring product does not breach those requi requirements. The Therapeutic Goods Administrator is another regulator and they will also have a, a focus and we're working closely with the Therapeutic Goods Administration. And in terms of the retail setting, uh, that would be certainly um, New South Wales Health would be the lead right. in doing that. But we do acknowledge that from time to time we do um, a ch a work in coordination with police and our other regulators in coordinated activity and really acknowledge the assistance police provide on when when the circumstances require that support from police. So, Yeah, that's my next, uh, leading to my next question. Um, when raids are to occur, on a particular retailer, so you've got information about a particular retailer that's selling <coughs> illegal vapes. New South Wales is the lead, New South Wales Health is the lead agency that uh, does the raid, or is um, it the police? So it's New South Wales Health is the lead agency, and we have um, way information sharing arrangements which we're just consolidating through an memorandum of understanding to share particular intelligence that might um, highlight any risks associated with our regulatory activities. Um, but in the main, we would uh, initiate that regulatory activity. What we also have done is coordinated action with Therapeutic Goods Administration. So there might be things that the Therapeutic Goods Administration intelligence that they have, that they might work in concert with us. Again, we look at the roles and responsibilities and we look at what we can um, contribute. But we are very clear that every uh, there's a number of regulatory agencies that have a role in in this achieving um, a reduction in the use of um, e-vapes. And our offices also are focused on illicit tobacco. So when they're going into the vape shops, they're also focused on loose leaf tobacco product, um, <coughs> nicotine pouches, um, single single sale of cigarettes, single cigarettes, sale of cigarettes to minors, and other offences in relation to tobacco. Because overall, we're interested in supporting the community to reduce um, both tobacco and e-cigarette use. And Assistant Commissioner, what role do you think the police have in relation to the enforcement of uh, illegal vapes uh, in retailers? So, mm. is it just a supporting agency to health, or do you have a a specific role? No, we support health. Health is a regulator. Um, at the Commonwealth level, um, Border Force is responsible for the border with AFP. We support those agencies. Um, and at a Commonwealth level, at a regulation level, um, the Therapeutic Goods Administration group. Um, and so we work with all of those partners to support them. Our primary interest in terms of any of this is relating to serious and organised crime matters, right. where there could be some overlap um, with a particular retail outlet um, then we might provide a, an additional you know, interest into that for other purposes. But in terms of vaping, in terms of tobacco generally, um, we support the regulator, which is health. So do you do your own intelligence or do you rely on the intelligence that health is providing to you? Um, primarily, primarily in terms of vaping, we would rely on the Therapeutic Goods Administration, Border Force and New South Wales Health in providing us with intelligence. Those frameworks are in place for that to occur. Um, we would generally only be interested in that if we found some other criminality associated with it or some organised crime involvement in that. Um, however, we also have a mechanism to provide those other agencies with limited information as well within the bounds of the, the law uh, to support what they may be doing in terms of their targeting and, and their approach to their issues. Thank you so much, um, Dr McDermott. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all very much for appearing today. It's nice to see you some again, although I, I know. Um, so we'll start with this as Commissioner Scott, um, a cook rather. Um, what, talk to me about organised crime in New South Wales and the impact that it has on the illicit market of, of e-cigarettes. How big is the market for them? At the moment I don't know that it's very big at all. Um, they've only just been prohibited at the Commonwealth level. Mm. Um, I, I anticipate based on that action by the Commonwealth um, in due course we will end up with some sort of illicit market. Um, it appears any time there's prohibition there's always, and there's a demand, there's always an illicit market that's generated. Um, the quantity and size of that market's unknown. Um, it may not 
may not grow to be a big market if the demand level or the demand side of the equation can be addressed properly because organised crime is basically motivated by cash and money. And so if, if there's no demand for a particular product, in this case um, e-cigarettes, um, then it's unlikely that that illicit market will grow too big. Um, if there's strong demand and that demand's not arrested um, early on, um, then potentially it could um, increase to a substantial level. Um, other tobacco products which have had import restrictions for some time, there's already a an illicit market around that, um, but by comparison it's nowhere near the prohibited drugs illicit markets. Alright, so you're, you're saying that organised crime really doesn't have much of a presence in, in vaping industry at the moment? At this it's point It's basically in time. pretty legal. Uh, so where, if, if children want to go and buy it, where do they buy it from? They can buy it from any tobacco retailer. Yeah, okay. So. Um, well, can I, so, can I just correct? So, certainly, um, yeah, certainly. I just want to make it clear that it's not <laughs> lawful to sell nicotine containing vapes in no. a retail setting, and there are also prohibitions on the sale to young people. So yes. whilst that doesn't is, stop... Uh, no, Chen, I, say I, that, I understand but, that. But we know the marketing of these products are, without the word nicotine on them, that there's been a, a complete change uh, to focus on children. Um, by the evidence that's come before us. So we've been given evidence over the last few months that we've had record importation levels of, um, of vapes, of e-cigarettes from China, millions and millions. Right? In the last few weeks, it's been record low. It dropped 93% as we're now going towards um, regulation at a federal level. Where do you think all those vapes are going? They're obviously going into storage somewhere, but is it... Is, Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner, it's not going to organise crime? Well, I think um, the, the Commonwealth uh, approached this in a staged approach. So mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they set a particular date for the ceasing of importations and then they allowed a certain period of time for retailers to then on sell or, or sell legally, the ones they're legally able to sell, mm -hmm. to sell those vapes. And so I think only on the 1st of March, and, and I'm sure Dr Chan will correct me if I'm wrong, but the 1st of March was the point in time where that that should have stopped. So there may well be stockpiles of vapes still, um, but at this point in time, I think retailers um, would be taking quite a bit of a risk to, to be selling them, given mm. that the Commonwealth has now prohibited those sales. So I remember some years ago, before I came into Parliament, I worked with a task force, a federal police and a state-based task force on legal tobacco. At that time, you could bring in a lot of tobacco, millions of dollars worth, and get next to no penalty for it. Do you know what the penalties are now if you do that with vapes, or what it might be in the future if the legal vapes? Uh, my recollection of the Commonwealth legislation is seven years. Seven years, so it's picked up. So it's similar to what it is now to tobacco? Uh, I, I think, think that's correct. I, I think the Commonwealth would be best to provide you with that okay. detail, but that's my, my understanding, yes. All right, thank you. Um, Dr Chen, I'll go across to you and to your team from New South Wales Health. Um, I've just talked about stockpiling of millions of product. Is there any evidence, have you heard of anything where those, that stockpile is going to or where those, those millions of vapes are going to? I'm, I am aware that the regulators are aware of those issues and obviously some of the things that are in the public domain have been, um, I think earlier this year with the Blitz, we did, um, the Th Therapeutic Goods Administration did announce that they targeted a number of warehouses and um, secured um, secure products. So, so clearly that looking for warehouses or other large um, places where stock may be held is part of the regulatory and um, compliance act activity. Um, but I don't have any other detail other than to note that there has been some focus on warehouse on warehouses that have contained or, or wholesalers or mm. or storage um, facilities where they've failed to comply with the requirements under the Commonwealth legislation. Okay, so if if your inspectors are found from health find a stockpile or they find Ill illicit uh, tobacco uh, not tobacco illicit uh, vapes, what's the process then? They seize it. Or they seize it. They seize it then it has to be taken away for testing or...? No. So no. it depends on the circumstances, but mm. 
they will seize, you know, where they where it contains nicotine or where they have reasonable suspicion. Uh, I'll probably get the terminology legally wrong from but my colleague Gemma can yeah. correct me. But on if they have a reasonable basis according to our Act, they can seize the product. Um, that product is then, um, in some circumstances, it might be tested. In other circumstances, we know that it contains nicotine. That product is then... Um, uh, uh, there's an opportunity for the retailer to provide contrary evidence in a period um, and then we get um, approval often from the retailers so often the retailers will be uh, proving for us to d destroy that product immediately where it's clearly um, containing nicotine we then um, dispose of that product using appropriate contractors we store it uh, we have storage facilities and then we set secure storage facilities that comply with the appropriate regulatory requirements and then we will discard and destroy that product. Okay. And how many inspectors do you have in doing this or how many employees in health are doing this type of compliance work? So we have a centralised core of inspectors um, and that is around sort of 10. I will can give the committee the exact sort of numbers. Um, we also have public health unit um, staff, um, particularly in our regions, that um, work alongside of, a, uh, of us, um, particularly on blitz activity. Mm. Um, so it is a matrix of both the centralised core of inspectors plus also our public health units um, in various districts mm. and um, our regional public health units that work with us on compliance activity. So they go and they visit the retailers, do they, in vaping stores? That's right. So we have a program of activities. Sometimes our inspectors from the centre will go out and compliment the staff. We're very aware of the um, communication techniques across the, um, the suppliers, the retail premises. Mm. And so what we have tended to do in terms of our modus of operandi is, is to try and um, target concurrently um, at, in a geographical location um, so that people are not given preemptive warning and can secure the stock in an inaccessible way. So yeah. we do try and do planned activity. We have a planned program of activity and obviously when new intelligence comes in we're able to deviate or, or respond to those needs but we do have a planned program of work across the state. Is there a particular area of the state where this is, is a lot more of this work is being done because there's a greater demand? Um, or a greater problem? We do try and service the whole um, the whole state. So I, I'm, I'm also very pleased to say that there has been a lot of compliance activity done in our regional areas. Um, so I would say that we don't we don't prioritise one area of, over another, but we do act on intelligence. And when our um, partners such as Border Force or or TGA have new evidence or new insights that we feel will yield a greater outcome. Um, we can we can modify our mm. program of work to to take those opportunities for greater seizures and greater regulatory impact of our activities. Is can you tell us a particular area, say in Sydney, that it has that, or just across the state? Uh, look, I think we would have to say that it is not that difficult to get nicotine containing mm. um, vapes. So this is a widespread issue. We are having to do you know until the Commonwealth legislation. Um, fully takes effect, um, our regulatory activity is just a tip of the iceberg. Mm. We are working very, very hard. We're seizing lots of products. We're acting with our regulatory partners. We are doing everything we can. But obviously, the border restrictions will have um, an impact. And we've, and anecdotally, and I wouldn't want to oversell this because it's, it's the sense of our inspectors, is that that has had an impact already on the supply. Um, but clearly the um, reforms, should they pass the Commonwealth um, uh, government's processes, will really um, cement, um, make compliance much easier because basically retail premises will not be able to provide, to sell um, e-cigarettes. Right, that, that kind of brings me into my segue. My next question, I'm asking both yourself and the Assistant Commissioner. The evidence put to us that when these federal um, regulations come through, and they do, it'll drive um, these um, products into an underground market, into a black market, um, and increase the amount of involvement of organised crime. Would you agree with that? Do you think that's what will happen? I would defer to um, the police who would know yeah. those criminal behaviours better. Yeah, so 
in some respects or, or some capacity, I think that's likely. That's that's the standard uh, occurrence for um, when we create um, prohibition. It creates illicit markets to some degree. And as I said earlier, um, how that will play out in terms of e-cigarettes is, in my view, uh, highly dependent on what we do about demand. If we address demand through education and 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 other methods so that there's not that drive for the illegal vapes, um, then the market, organised crime is not going to invest in the market, it's not going to make the money. So I, I, think, I think the jury's out on that and I don't know which way it will go. If we do nothing about demand and it would follow any other illicit commodity um, and I imagine uh, that there would be a, a black market that develops as a result of that. We, we do a lot of work for tobacco. They still bring in millions of dollars of, of chop and other things and it's used in shishas and all kinds of things. Right, so that demand is still there. Correct. So, wouldn't you just equate that was to be the similar type of problem with we have with vaping? Yeah, I guess the qu open question is about who's using vapes, and, and if it's predominantly children, where there's an opportunity to intervene before hitting the criminal justice system, um, we would encourage that as a method because that may well arrest the demand for vapes. Mm. In terms of other tobacco products, that that ship sailed. Um, there's already a black market for those other tobacco yes. products. Um, and it's high yield, low risk in terms of organised crime, but it doesn't it doesn't compare to the illicit drug market by comparison, black market by comparison. So, I think it's a matter of perspective around these things. And I think, given that vapes have only just been prohibited at the border, I don't think that we can um, foresee um, how that will end up. It will follow the same trajectory as other illicit commodities, unless something is done about demand early. Thank you. I just there, the market at the moment is actually an illicit market by and large because nicotine um, containing vapes are in fact illegal unless they're supplied by um, a medical pathway, so by a medical practitioner or nurse practitioner. So the only vapes that should be sold in the only legal vapes that should be sold in retail premises in fact should not have nicotine, but that is not necessarily what we are seeing. So the market at the moment is in fact to some like to a large degree an illicit market. That, that's right, we have a large yeah. illicit market, yeah, that's, that's all the evidence keeps on showing yes. to yeah. us. Um, so the question is, this is the million dollar question is now, what's been the barriers to actually increase the amount of compliance of, um, enforcement and what can we as a government, what can we recommend that this government does to, to, to assist health, to New South Wales Health, to actually increase the amount of enforcement? So the current... in. The current um, landscape is such that we have um, basically there's so, been so many uh, access points for this. The the uptake of young people, the demand has been great. People are able to access it through various routes, and that's driven e e economic gain from the, this this product. To some extent, the really the Commonwealth legislation which will come into effect will make it very clean that retail premises will not be able to sell this product, which means that regulatory activity will be very simplified because these premises, it's not a question of whether they know that the pro product contains nicotine. It will be clear that um, they are, that they're, they're, they're conducting unlawful activities. So the regulatory process will be very stream streamlined because at the moment we have to, in some circumstances, um, demonstrate a, an, an awareness of um, nicotine in the product mm. to affect the prosecution. I have written um, as Chief Health Officer to all of the um, retailers telling them that they should not rely on any assertions that the product does not contain nicotine. I think it's been very clear in the media that um, the product they have would, on the benefit of doubt, they should assume that the product they've been on selling contains nicotine. Um, but the legal processes are that we have to prove those elements uh, of the offence. So clearly, the um, current regulatory environment um, isn't supporting, isn't robust enough for us to um, achieve the compliance we need, and clearly, we are um, looking forward to the Commonwealth's um, legislation which will then move this to a prescription um, prescription model. And the Commonwealth reforms in when they banned the um, import of um, vapes, 
also assist because they had the same problem in trying to differentiate between the non-nicotine vapes versus the nicotine vapes. Mm. So covering the field in effect in relation to importation, you would expect, we would hope, will assist um, by at least making compliance easier mm. and detection easier. Okay. So last question. Uh, we have asked the retail, the industry to be here. Uh, we've asked the vaping industry to appear. They've refused um, a number of occasions, including the tobacco industry. So I'm just wondering what engagement you have. You've just said you've written to the retail industry. Um, do they openly engage with you on these issues or is it like us being stonewalled? Um, look, I can confirm, I'd have to take on notice what engagement that our that the teams have done in speaking to the retailer associations. Mm. All I can confirm to the committee is that I've written, um, looking at a cut on at least um, a couple of occasions to retailers highlighting the issue um, directly to them. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have uh, the member for Orange online. Uh, Phil, are you there? I'm here. Can you see me and hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. Mate. Right but that's fine, they can okay. hear you. Yeah. That's all right. Um, look, uh, thank you and welcome uh, to the hearing. Um, I know we've heard from um, Dr. Chan before in, in, in evidence in relation to this matter, but uh, I wanted to, I suppose, um, I just heard the chair in his question, I think it was to um, to Miss Broderick. Um, and I just want to clarify something if I heard it correctly. Um, was it 12 enforcements or prosecutions was that the number that I heard that the chair asked in relation to uh, proceedings that have been commenced for matters involving vapes or illegal um, e-cigarettes? Uh, that was the number referred to by by the chair, but I think the the actual figure that I have is I think it's 44, 40, 40 defendants um, for both nicotine and for e-cigarettes for two thousand and twenty three. Um, yes. So. It's not quite, it's more than 12, but that, that 40 defendants includes both for um, uh, allegation, well, convictions in relation to both cigarettes and uh, nic nicotine vapes. So they're, they're people who have appeared before the court and have been convicted, is that right? Okay. Just, um, clar just clarify that number, 45? 40. For, 40 defendants, it, it can differ how you count because I said sometimes they're um, charged and convicted of both offences relating to nicotine and, and for, um, yeah. e cigarettes. We can get you the formal figures um, um, on notice and we can get back to you on that. Yeah, if you can but, take yeah. it on and notice. Could you tell us what the result, like the penalty was as well uh, when you come back to us? Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Phil, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'll continue. Yeah. Um, over what period of time are we talking about that those prosecutions were, um, is that on the calendar year or? Yes, the or calendar what? year for 2023. Okay. And do you know how many penalty infringement notices or pins have been issued during that time? Uh, I'd take that on notice as well and, and can get back to you and it'd be more than that. But I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take sure. that on notice. And, and, and cautions and confiscations, do you have that we information? Can, we can take that. I mean, we could say I can provide the committee the details of the conversation. Um, so in 2023, New South Wales health inspectors conducted over 3,000 inspections. We seized around 431,000 nicotine vapes and e-liquids with an estimated yeah. street value of 13.7 million. And we seized more than 4.8 million cigarettes and 1,700 kilograms of other illegal tobacco products with an estimated street value of over 5.8 million. Right. Is, is um, and sorry, Dr. Chan, I missed the number. The, the sound was dropping in and out when I was uh, listening to you answer some other questions. But um, in terms of the number of inspectors that you have, health inspectors, uh, you said there was a centralised core of inspectors, but how many are there across the state? Was it 12? Did I hear you say 12? Um, not across the state. So just in terms of not wanting to mislead, um, you, yes. There is a centralised um, team, and I'll just get the updated yeah. numbers because we're just in the process of recruiting some additional staff for that team. So I just want to give the committee the correct number, but it is a small, small team, um, centrally. And then we also work with our colleagues, environmental health officers located in our public health units that complement yeah. the, the regulatory um, teams that we use. 
Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. The minister recently announced uh, 12 new inspectors. So that he, he announced um, uh, additional inspectors for pharmaceutical services, right? Um, as well as some additional tobacco. And in addition to that, we've also recently recruited some additional, we're in the process of re um, increasing further the number. Okay, thank you. But it, it, it is an upgrade. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Chen, continue, sorry. Um, but just to say, it is a small team that's working with its colleagues across the, the state to undertake the regulatory activity, but we're also working very closely with the other regulatory authorities, such as Therapeutic Goods Administration. So how big is a small team? Um, I think I just have to check the numbers, but it's in the order of 10. 10. Okay. To, cover, to cover the whole state? No, that's the central core team, and that team then um, will work with our colleagues in local health districts, environmental health offices, and we will yes. usually put together a mixed team that then does regulatory yeah. activity according to a program of work. Is it is it fair to say that those um, environmental health uh, offices, is that one per LHT? Um, it, it varies by local health district and a number of people can be authorised under the Act and, and assist in aspects of the regulatory work. Um, so the, in some districts, it will be more than one environmental health officer that's involved in, in the activity. Because obviously in, in the country where I am and, you know, um, mm. the, the tyranny of distance can often uh, make it very hard for enforcement officers um, to get around their, their patch. It seems to me that you are grossly under-resourced. Look, the you agree with that? I think the compliance activity um, I just want to acknowledge the teams working hard and acknowledge the rural teams. They're working very diligently to do as much as they, they can, but at the moment the size of the problem is quite quite oner it, it, onerous. It is worth noting also that we have been given evidence by a number of, of people who have come before us um, who are very supportive of the work that they're doing and saying how good a great job they are doing, but they've all said they're under-resourced. Is that, I'm not making any criticism, Dr. Chen, and I don't expect you to say it, but it would appear, at least from my own uh, opinion, that you guys, especially the inspectors, are, are grossly under-resourced to tackle the problem across New South Wales. I'll make that as a comment. I don't expect you to, 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 to agree or disagree, but um, I think based on the numbers that you've given us, that would appear evident. Um, I wanted to ask some questions also now of um, Assistant Commissioner Cook. Can you hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, do, do the police need further powers or resources, whether search and seizure powers or or other uh, powers to... I, I appreciate health is the main combat agency in relation to this, but do police also need additional powers of either search or seizure or other other areas that, that, that could facilitate or help police do their job uh, in relation to... Or, or easier to do their job in relation to these issues? No, not at all. Police have sufficient powers for their purposes and their, and their charter. Um, yeah. I think perhaps, um, as I said earlier, um, looking at um, non-criminal uh, approaches to this in the first instance is probably a pref preferable way to go. Um, uh, we notice um, that there's no actual licensing scheme in New South Wales for tobacco sellers. Um, and by that I mean actually having to hold a licence and maintain a licence and something that health, for example, could take away if they weren't complying. That doesn't exist at this point in time and I think that that's a challenge for health. So I think we would throw our weight behind uh, some reform uh, in accordance with uh, health needs so that they can undertake their role uh, more effectively. Um, in terms of policing, we have sufficient search and seizure powers. We can use Commonwealth powers um, you know, the, the Commonwealth legislation in regards to search and seizure we can use. So the police are not seeking any additional um, okay. any powers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. I've, I've got no further questions, Mr Chair. Thank you. I'll move to um, Member for Cabramatta, Mr Vo. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr Kerry Chant and Gemma Bodrick and um, Professor Tracy O'Brien and uh, Assistant Commissioner Scott Cook for coming in today and uh, your evidence is going to be very important because uh, New South Wales Health and New South Wales Police are going to play a very 
uh, play a very important role in in, um, in reducing the harm and um, usage of uh, uh, e-cigarettes. <coughs> My uh, question is, um, uh, what research is New South Wales, uh, this is to the uh, uh, New South Wales Health, what research is New South Wales Health undertaking into the dangers of um, passive uh, vaping? So in terms of the um, effects into passive um, vaping, we're not undertaking directed research, but we're very much um, surveying the international literature on, pa on the, the passive effects of exposure to sec what we'd call secondhand vape. Um, we're also um, reviewing the evidence just around um, particle exposure in general and, and, and looking at anything that can give us some guidance to what those impacts um, would be. We obviously know that in relation to tobacco, the, the information around secondhand um, smoke in terms of those impacts were a long time coming. But we are also looking at very much the basic research as, as well. So no specifically funded research. It's going to be generated in all sorts of different forms across the, the world. But um, did you want to add anything, no, Tracy? No, I think that, yeah. that covers that. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. And um, so what, what impact, um, this is due to New South Wales Health, what impact does vaping have on uh, adolescent mental health Uh, um, I've had the privilege to discuss this with a number of our um, colleagues in youth and adolescent um, physicians and I think we're really concerned about the impact of nicotine on the developing brain. We're concerned around that the fact that it, if someone is anxious or, or depressed or using it for any other um, reasons, then it can actually exacerbate those conditions. Um, and you get this sort of cycle where the young person is smoking it to relieve, is vaping to relieve stress, but then when they withdraw, they become addicted to the nicotine, and then when they try and stop the nicotine, they actually get all the symptoms of anxiety and feeling anxious. So we actually think um, it's not an appropriate way um, for young people. We need to support young people's mental health and well-being, and that these products are really very counterproductive and I, I've really been um, very chastened by the stories that young people have told us about how the vapes and that when they become, how rapidly they become addicted um, and how surprised they are at how quickly they become addicted to it and how it often takes a very, um, maybe a health, um, in one case um, someone was admitted to um, almost I think intensive care. Um, or, or having something else that really makes them reflect on how the <coughs> e, the e vaping has almost controlled their life or had this impact, and it's often been that sort of aha moment. And I've got to say that the young people that we've used in our campaigns, or the young people that have come forward as advocates, are very powerful <laughs> in telling the story about how they would not recommend this to other young people. And I've really been very um, privileged to hear young people really wanting to support other young people not um, get addicted to vapes. And Tracy, did you want to sort of No, no, on? I just would, would echo that and the, the work that's been done by New South Wales Cancer Institute takes responsibility for the uh, social marketing, the behaviour change campaigns. Uh, a lot of formative research goes into that. We, we spend a lot of time with young people, uh, hearing from young people, both vapors and non-vapors, uh, around the, the harms that they're concerned about, uh, what it is that's motivating them to, to quit uh, so that we can share that information and the behaviour change change campaign uh, that is currently in market at the moment, the Every uh, Vape is a Hit to Your Health campaign, uh, is the voice of young people uh, influencing other young people. It's incredibly powerful. Um, and as Kerry said, uh, uh, those, those stories um, are sobering. Uh, what is also sobering is that young people really do want to quit 
as well and all of the information in the campaign, both evaluation uh, pre-concept and, and also post is, is that they do want to quit, they want tools to quit, they understand how, how powerful uh, the drug of nicotine is, how damaging that, that can be, um, as well as the other health harms that we've heard across the inquiry uh, on, on people's health from vaping. How long has the campaign been going? Uh, there's been <coughs> three phases to, to campaigns that have been run for, through, the, through the Institute. Um, this current campaign is phase three. Um, this started in, in January of this year. It was, it was launched uh, in an event uh, by the, the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Health and, and Dr Chant and I were there, as well as two passionate young advocates who appear on, on one of the campaigns. So that campaign uh, will, will run across this year. Um, it's uh, a number of uh, features to the campaign. There is um, runs through all of the social channels. It's directly targeted towards 14 to, to 24 year olds. There is um, the only thing that you may may see is stuff at a cinema, um, unless uh, you're frequenting TikTok or or other channels yeah, that young people. It's very sad. <laughs> young people. Uh, it's also influencers involved in that campaign. And I think very important to say is it's not just a, a public health uh, campaign. Um, it's connected to, to then tools and further information that points young people towards. Um, cessation tools as well. Um, it's connected to, to websites and, and lots of information that's provided around the options for cessation as well for young people. And I'm sorry, Therese, how are you assessing, like, what, what point will you know how successful the campaign is? Um, how are you doing that? Yeah, so there's a formal process to doing to doing that. The, the last campaign, a uh, phase two of the, the campaign ran through 2022 to, to 2023. That was, uh, do you know what your vaping campaign uh, is about, um, and that had uh, was targeted towards uh, 14 to 17 year olds, um, and uh, that looked to expose the truths around the harms of of hate, uh, vaping and the contents of vape, but also um, really looked towards um, empowering young people to to quit vaping or not take up vaping as well, to so to address some of those uh, social norms around vaping that were we were seeing rapidly emerge. Um, for it becoming a normalised beh behaviour. Um, so that campaign has been evaluated um, and hasn't been published yet, but I, but I can share and I'm happy to provide some evidence to the, to the committee uh, afterwards that um, that campaign reached the target audience. We know that uh, above the projected averages. And among the vapors who, who saw the campaign, 71% indicated that they intended to try and quit. Uh, from seeing the, the uh, campaign. And those that don't vape, over 90% of them, at the campaign actually reinforced not vaping as well. Um, and there's a formal evaluation process and, and lots more questions from that. In the current campaign, what we do have is we test uh, the uh, formula, the, the final campaign product. We test it in a pre-launch with a number of young people, and that's been done with hundreds of, of young people, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. And we test that uh, that, that it's well understood um, and that it's likely to in invoke behaviour change uh, as well with that. And that's tested very, very favourably as well. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, thank you for that. And uh, during the um, hearing, especially today, uh, I, we heard that um, e-cigarettes and vapes are not as harmful as tobacco, uh, and uh, it also could be um, uh, beneficial, uh, beneficial to some people. Uh, to youth, I think What you are said. your views of it? You know? So I think New South Wales Health's position and that's a position shared by the Cancer Institute. It's the best situation to neither vape nor smoke. Both are harmful for health. And actually the comparison is probably a little misleading because they're very different products mm -hmm. and we're yet to know the full, um, we haven't had a sufficient follow-up for the long-term health effects of vapes, but we know that um, from some of the basic science sort of studies that they do cause irritation, um, scarring, um, things that are precursors to um, poor lung health in the longer a longer term. We know about the other impacts that I've described on neurodevelopment, um, also on pregnant um, on pregnancy. So that we certainly wouldn't describe them as a safe um, product, but 
uh, we do recognise that um, we're open to the role of a prescribed um, prescription in limited circumstances, but in terms of the hierarchy of evidence, the evidence is stronger for other um, methods of quit, including other nicotine replacement therapies. And so whilst it may be useful to uh, to consider this in the armor, armatory of, uh, for a clinician, it will be on a very case-by-case -case basis and in very specific circumstances where, it's, where that benefit and risk is really weighed up carefully. It's not a product that we would encourage um, ubiquitous use. But Tracy, would you like to? Yeah, look, I could speak specifically to the, the risks of cancer. I think that there was evidence this morning that the, the risks may be, be less or there'd be no risk of cancer. And I I, um, I think what, what is clear is uh, w there is no definitive either population or individual based evidence that vaping causes cancer. Um, I'd take caution to, to stopping at a full stop after that sentence um, simply because we don't have the duration of time to be able to, to prove that. Uh, tobacco uh, smoking took uh, decades to prove that it caused cancer. It wasn't until the 1960s that we knew that uh, tobacco smoking caused lung cancer. And then several decades after that, we now know that uh, 15 other cancers apart from lung cancer are caused by, by tobacco smoking as well. We do know that there are 200-odd uh, chemicals contained within vapes, and many of those chemicals are known to cause cancer. Uh, I believe in some of the submissions and, and this morning some evidence was given that the quantities of those chemicals are much less and therefore less likely to cause cancer. Again, I, I caution uh, that um, both as the Chief Cancer Officer but also as a, a paediatric uh, cancer specialist, um, our understanding of cancer really has evolved uh, with genetics and, and uh, um, the biology of cancer and we know that uh, cancer is almost like a, a fingerprint each of us us are, are unique. It's not necessarily a, a dose response. If you're if you're exposed to X number of chemicals, you will develop cancer in in X time. Some people may develop cancer much earlier than than other people. So it's not a straightforward uh, equation um, from from that point of view. So uh, I, I have concerns about the the health impacts in terms of cancer of the products that are currently being exposed to to, to young people. And so a as access to vapes in retail settings become more restricted, are people likely to turn to tobacco or black market um, nicotine products, you think? So that's, I suppose in terms of our approach, we're very keen to s manage um, illicit tobacco products as well, as we know that the um, approach to tobacco, which is um, the plain packaging, um, uh, tax, taxation um, are important barriers to entry and maintenance. So part of our approach to actually reducing the harms of tobacco is to make sure we maintain a very strong vigilance in relation to loose leaf tobacco, sales of single, single cigarettes and any other related um, products. So it is about a combined approach because we want to reduce the harms of tobacco smoking and the population and there's still much more work to be done there as well. Mm. We have made great inroads but we are now, um, we still have a lot of disparity in terms of smoking rates in, in some of our um, communities that we need to tackle and we need to tackle the, the, the challenge of um, e-cigarettes as well. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, could the proposed flavour restrictions deter, uh, <coughs> because I think they were restricted to just two flavours tobacco and mint. That's would the federal the fe federal approach. approach. Yeah. yeah. Would this deter e-cigarette users from accessing therapeutic vapes uh, through a prescription pathway in favour of the black market product, do you think? Uh, what, I mean, personally I see that if someone is wanting to cease um, tobacco, there really needs to be a strong um, bond and a therapeutic relationship with the primary care provider that supports them through that journey, um, that the normal route would be a trial of a number of different strategies that suit the person um, and conventional NRT. And then if there was an assessment of risk, um, that these products would be used. I think in the context of a therapeutic um, approach, the use of mint or some other, you know, having two choices is probably inappropriate for that um, paradigm. I think it's too early to speculate um, 
but I, I really see that the prescribing of e-cigarettes um, in a therapeutic pathway allows for that um, the best outcomes for the pa for mm -hmm. the patients. And what we would like to see is cessation. We wouldn't want to see dual use, which is also a pattern in the data showing that um, that that many people are, are maintaining dual use of products. Mm. Could I just also go back? Um, the team have provided me with the fact that we've got 11 officers currently in the tobacco team in the ministry. So apologies to that one person I'd not counted. Um, we have uh, over 50 authorised um, uh, inspectors in our local health districts. They're the partners that we do work with. Work with. Um, and we're currently um, looking for additional three contractor positions to boost us over this you know over this period and make sure that we have a full complement um, going ahead for uh, the continued high level of um, compliance activity. Thank you for clarifying. Can I just yeah, uh, sorry, I've got go a few on, more yeah. questions for yeah, New South Wales Police. I think that's okay. Like, yeah, um, yeah. I'd like to, to ask Assistant Commissioner Scott uh, Cook. Um, so how does regional and rural New South Wales compare with metropolitan areas in terms of the extent of illegal retail supply of e-cigarettes and tobacco? And are police in regional and rural communities sufficiently resourced to carry out enforcement actions against these businesses? Um, so the first point I'd make is that police are not required to take out and carry out enforcement activity. That's the responsibility of health. And in those, in those areas, police have been very conscious and very willing to assist health and in fact I think most of the enforcement activity undertaken by health has been in those regional areas and police have supported those operations so um, it, it's not a, a great impost on police um, um, but it sometimes is uh, difficult to arrange timings for police depending on other workloads but we've undertaken to health to support them in, in their efforts and wherever we can practically do that um, we will do that and continue to do that. Yeah, I'm not quite sure whether this question was asked before, but so how much money is organised crime making from illegal vapes? We don't know the answer to that question. Okay. And, there, and, um, if I can just jump in, the reason for that question, we've had earlier evidence that uh, suggested that all the imports that are coming in are done by organised crime, and they're the ones that are selling those products to the retailers. Well, so he's saying majority of vapes are controlled by organised crime, but uh, organised crime. But your evidence is contrary to that. Yeah, we would disagree with that. The uh, the vape market up until recently um, was supplied on a legal basis. Yeah, and so um, in other countries where these vapes are coming from, they're all legal. Yeah, that's legal, not illegal. Yeah. And so um, there's no need for an illicit market from those, or an organised crime market, yeah. to drive that into Australia. But recently, with the change, that may change as well. Yeah. Um, but we haven't seen that yet. Okay. And, and, and like say, are the current uh, penalties for illegal selling e-liquids and e-cigarettes containing nicotine adequate? If not, how would you like to see them change? So I think the um, Minister has flagged that um, consequent on the Commonwealth legislation once that finally um, Go, passes through and we, we're clear on, on the parameters of that, um, that will certainly increase penalties signific significantly and we are looking at other um, minor modifications um, that the Minister's asked us to look at in terms of the penalties but also things like disposal costs and other range. So in, in responding to the Commonwealth legislation, we are taking a look over all our tobacco legislation and looking at if there are ways that we can streamline the, to facilitate the compliance. So do you foresee legislation changes once the Commonwealth um, has acted in New South Wales? Um, we foresee that there will be a tidy up required um, and Gemma is probably yeah. the best person to talk to that. It's something that we're considering and we'll need to see what happens with the Commonwealth yeah. legislation, how it passes and then how best to actually implement it in New South Wales and whether or not we need some complementary legislation or whether or not we need to um, also just increase generally regulatory mm -hmm. provisions in order to um, assist with compliance and enforcement. Tree, do you have any yeah, more? I've got the last one, like, you know, last one, like, um, to, to, to both, like, you know, New South Wales Health and Police. So what needs to happen for the prescription model to work effectively? Uh, what role do you see the New South Wales government uh, play in ensuring compliance with that pathway? 
So um, what we, I think, have a role in is, is providing evidence. You know, we see that um, cessation therapy and um, overall preventive health care should be delivered primarily by primary, primary care. So clearly partnering effectively with primary care to support um, evidence-based, um, increasing evidence-based knowledge of the use of um, smoking cessation um, and to make sure that they're aware of the different options for them, the different evidence-based underpinning them. And I've got to say we've been have, running a number of webinars with um, our RACG, RACGP colleagues and I think mm -hmm. um, you attended one earlier no, this Monday. Monday. Mm -hmm. um, but we've run a series of that. So supporting general practice to really know the evidence so that they can provide the best um, evidence to their patients. I think then there is regulatory activity. Um, we are also working closely with our pharmacist colleagues. Again, for them to, um, we see that pharmacists are often a point of contact mm. that um, community might ask. And again, working with pharmacy groups to ensure that there's a high level of knowledge of the evidence and, and processes in the pharmacy sector. We will also, um, as part of the previous announcement of governments, have increasing our pharmaceutical regulatory activity um, because obviously as the border, as the product coming in is largely pharmaceutical um, in nature and we will want to make sure that that's not diverted um, and so our pharmaceutical services area has a regulatory function in working with wholesalers and others to make sure that those controls are in, in place. So our focus at the moment is really education and support um, to those people that would be the prescribers um, and also working with the community to make sure that they understand the evidence base and are open, you know, know where to go to access help and support. And then as we progress through the regular, you know, depending if the Commonwealth legislation comes into effect, we understand that we'll also have an increased role in the pharmaceutical regulatory compliance area. And if I could just add the other parts of the education that we're, we're working on is uh, education modules for, for different touch points within the health system um, for opportunities to identify those that, that smoke or vape and, and connecting to, to vape services. And we're also working at the Institute to develop education programs for other youth workers outside of New South Wales Health who, could, who benefit from, from that education as well. As um, Assistant Commissioner, have anything to else to say? In terms of uh, I don't have anything to say beyond what I've previously said, and that is, um, I think a, a licensing scheme um, would be useful for the government to consider. Um, that makes that places an onus on retailers and others, whether they're chemists or retailers or whoever it ends up being, distributing these things um, to do the right thing, uh, not the wrong thing, uh, because there's some risk of them losing their business and their livelihood. And I think um, keeping it within that civil space in terms of civil penalty space is probably the first step I would suggest. Mm. The last thing we want to see as police is criminalisation of vaping, uh, particularly for young people. It'll bring them in contact with the criminal justice system they will never get out of. So um, I think um, I would suggest treating very carefully around um, using the criminal justice system and I would perhaps focus as much as possible on the, on the civil penalty system. Mm -hmm. Just um, all pharmacists, like once the Commonwealth reforms come in, um, the only people that will actually be able to sell uh, any types of vapes will in fact be really the pharmacists. So they'll have to either be supplied on prescription um, mm. by a pharmacist or direct um, supply by a doctor or nurse practitioner. Uh, pharmacists themselves all have to already be approved. So there is a scheme, the Pharmacy Council of New South Wales actually approves all community pharmacies. And that'll make it easier for enforcement, because once that's in place... Well, that, that's, that'll be the legal pathway. Yeah, so that's what, in place. Yes. Then any retailer, whether it's got nicotine, no Correct. nicotine... Correct. They shouldn't be illegal. selling it. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a very so cut, cut and dry uh, offence if they so are selling it. So if... Uh, yeah, done? I'm done. Okay, Thank so you. let's Dr. go back to compliance. Thanks for that. Um, with tobacco, okay, if... If, you've, if you're caught smoking in a restricted area or um, someone is selling tobacco and they haven't got a license to do that, they can, they, they can be fined by a health inspector, obviously of the Department of Health, correct? What about a council equivalent? Uh, the smoke-free 
um, Environment Act. So I think there's two different offences you're talking about in they terms are, of yeah. the... Um, so if you're looking at um, smoking in a smoke-free environment, I think, mm. Gemma, we're the, we're the enforcers of the Smoke-Free Environment Act. Which also includes vaping. So yeah. you can't... In the same places that you can't smoke, you can't vape. I understand that. Yep. Let's just start back over a minute. I'll explain why in a moment. Yep. So if you're smoking, smoking a cigarette or a vape, in a restricted area where they're not allowed to do that, who can find that person? New South Wales Health. Health. New South Wales. Inspector. Can council inspector do it? They sometimes, as I understand it, have their own bylaws. Um, yep. And I think um, transport, transport might have for its own as regulation well. as well mm -hmm. relating to smoking, say, on, on transport yep. stops. Um, so it can differ. But, but generally speaking, it would be New South Wales Health. Health. But there is a, a, some and there are bylaws for council I, I, That's I understand, yes. What about New South Wales Police? Um, I think we have some um, capacity on trains and, and transport, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure about the um, other particular okay. places. So potentially for tobacco, and there might appear some vapes, they can be fined by all three groups, okay? With, Ill with, Ill with illicit uh, sale of vapes, when it comes in finally, Right. Who can actually um, seize those products? Just health? So this is something that we will need to consider yep. um, if the Commonwealth legislation passes. So the Commonwealth legislation is an amendment to their Therapeutic Goods Act. Um, the, I think the expectation is, well, the states and territories will need to work with the, together with the Commonwealth about who's actually going to enforce it. Mm. You would generally expect that the Commonwealth would be enforcing more around the border, so yep. trying to stop the border, and then the retail supply would come back to the states and territories. Um, but how that's actually going to work, um, it, it is in the TGA Act. We will, I think we are looking and considering whether or not it's actually better to have some kind of compl complementary legislation within New South Wales legislation to ease enforcement. Um, so that will need to be considered. Mm -hmm. That None of the Commonwealth legislation, though, relates to where people vape. So no, it's fine. Let's go back yep. to the retailers. Yeah, the okay. retailers, yes. So who, at the moment, right, if you have an illicit product, right, a vape, you can be basically seized and, yes. and fined by health. Yes. And police are also authorised. Officers That's under my the next poisons. question. Okay, so police can do that as well. They can seize the product and issue a police, fine. Per, or, police or are authorised under. The, my understanding is all police officers under, are authorised under the poisons. Yes. Act. So the the arrangements in place at the moment, the Therapeutic Goods Act, kind of sets the general requirement. So nicotine is a Schedule Four substance. Yep. Um, it can generally be only prescribed or supplied by a medical practitioner or nurse practitioner or a pharmacist on prescription, um, and then. The enforcement of the Poisons and Therapeutic Goods Act officers within New South Wales Health are authorised officers. New South Wales Police are all authorised officers as well. In in practice, um, although um, this is good, um, police um, can correct me, but they don't actually get involved. They would get involved in some that are more, some of the medicines that are more sort of illegal. Mm. So um, uh, some of the steroid type products. Um, mm -hmm. and the like or peptides, they may have more of involvement where there's um, a more of an illicit market. And what would happen though, when if the Commonwealth Legislation Act passes, it wouldn't be in our poisons legislation, it would be in the Commonwealth Therapeutic Goods Act. Yes. Yep. So the intent, as I understand it, for the Commonwealth is for them to authorise officers of the states and territories to enforce the Commonwealth legislation and the Commonwealth TGA Act. Um, and so that's one option. Another option that we are considering is whether or not it's actually better to think about actually we put something within our own framework, which is more readily understood, I think, by officers, mm -hmm. and to kind of mirror almost the Commonwealth provisions. So do you think that with, and, you know, I know that they've, you've given us the numbers of how many inspectors health has, and it amazes me the amount of work they've done with such small numbers, and that's a real credit to them. Um, is it worth expanding the power up to the so New South Wales Police can also start doing more of this work? Um, so they can do more seizures, they can do more work other than just supporting health? That question, mate? It can be. Yeah, question. so well, New South Wales Police has uh, significantly other higher priorities than, than doing enforcement work for vapes. Um, notwithstanding that, we have sufficient, as I said earlier, we have sufficient powers to do seizures. 
uh, where there's that overlap with organised crime, um, New South Wales Police definitely has an interest. Mm. Um, and in those circumstances, would be available and will contribute. Mm. Uh, and in fact, in some circumstances, would lead um, you know efforts to uh, curb unlawful supply. Um, however, in terms of a regulatory approach to um, do inspections or things like that. Um, vaping would not be a priority for the New South Wales Police, given yeah, it, other it, priorities. Yeah, I understand you say it's not a priority, but that's not, that's not really your call. It'll be what the government suggests is a priority, and I do know what you're saying, um, but you go back to a lot of theories about what they should be focusing on, and I accept what you've just said, but the priority should be what the community expects the priority should be. And the fact that children as young as 11 are getting addicted because they're being sold vapes illegally, and there's not being enough enforcement about that, needs to be seriously considered. Well, so, I agree with that. But right. I, I take that on board well, when there's other more hideous, hideous crimes than that need to be dealt with and there's maybe and, not and, enough police. And, and to be fair, I think uh, if that's the government's position, then, then health should be resourced to do that properly. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you all um, for your contribution today. It's been very informative. Um, you will be provided with a copy of the transcript of today's uh, proceedings for corrections. And the committee staff will also email you any um, supplementary questions um, that uh, you might need to respond to. Um, that concludes our public hearing for today. So thank you all once again for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.